So is everything, do you, is it rolling? Okay, can I have a motion to open the meeting? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The motion's okay. carried. Please everybody stand for the pledge. The flag is back there. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Great. Thank you, everybody, and welcome for coming tonight. We have um, a bunch of special things tonight that we're going to be doing. And uh, just, I need to add to the agenda um, the update on Town Hall Move, which has been happening this entire week, so we'll have an update on that. And uh, a personal issue that I just need to talk to the board about. Okay, so, and it's relative to the budget. So, can I have a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, what I'm going to do is ask um, to hold off on public input until after the presentation because um, our guests have to be someplace afterwards. And I do know that there's probably some people who want to speak on the Pilgrim Pipeline, and I told them not to come till 6.30 because of Elliot's presentation first. So I'll let public input come afterwards if that's okay. So, um, we have um, our controller, Elliot Auerbach, and the deputy controller, Joe Ariel, who are here with us tonight. And we want to thank you, A, first of all, for undertaking this really important um, study that you've done. And as you know, um, New Pulse is sort of in the eye of the storm right now. So we certainly appreciated the work that you've done. And um, thank you to the town board for um, wanting to have Elliot come and uh, speak. So we'll turn it over to you, Elliot, and then I know, Joe, you're gonna do some presentations, and then I know that the board has a lot of questions, and the public might at that point want to ask questions, and I'll open it up to the public then. That's great, because then it gets picked up by the, um, by the... And everyone will have a stiff neck as they move the left. Can I move it over? You can move it over if you want. It was just that's where it was put. Do I need to have my opinion approval on my picture? How's this? Is this maybe something? That looks great. That's better. And, 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 and thank you, uh, Supervisor Zimmett, and um, council members, and a special thanks to Dan Torres, who um, harped at me to come and <laughs> juggled schedules around to figure out how it could both fit for the board and, and for our staff. And we also have to thank Kevin Barry for when you wanted to move it to 530, and we were in the midst of our move, I said, why don't we push it back a little bit? And Kevin said, absolutely not. Well, thank you. Uh, so, so I guess I'm the fluff, and my deputy controller Joe Ariel is the stuff tonight. And, and, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna fluff it up a little and explain a few things about um, how we got to do this report, and really what was the impetus behind it, and what prompted us to to take it to the level that we did. And um, you know, I have to confess that I did sit on the IDA board for four years, I think it was four years, back uh, between 2000 and 2010. So I actually got to peek behind the curtain and see the wizard, or w what was prompted to be the wizard, and, and got a better understanding, quite honestly, of what IDAs were all about. And little did I know that, you know, fast forward 10 years later, that I would be pretty much on the, not on the opposite side, but uh, looking at it from a different perspective. And the irony, quite honestly, was when I first came on the scene as the controller in 2009, um, we, Ulster County, um, launched a lawsuit against one of the IDA recipients and named also the Ulster County IDA to try and collect about $200,000 worth of unpaid pilots and property taxes. Um, so I had a, uh, a different perspective from it, uh, from that level. Um, you know, what really what prompted this IDA report was a December 2013 report uh, that we put out about wholly exempt properties. And let, let me just preface it by saying all our reports are online. 
We have a quirky name for our website. It's called YourEyesOnUlster.com because that's who we think we are. We think we are the taxpayers' eyes on Ulster County, and that will get you to our site and link you to any report that we, we did. But what prompted, what prompted this report was this, this wholly, wholly exempt report. And in the report, it lists town by town every wholly exempt property um, as of 2013. And on the last page, there was a list of IDA recipients spread out throughout the county. Um, and it gave us some insight into the impact that IDAs had throughout the county. And you know, specifically, um, it, it was eye-opening, first of all, to see uh, how many thousands of, of wholly exempt properties there were, um, that they were assessed when you aggregated them together at about $1.8 billion. Um, and then we drilled deep into different towns. <laughs> um, we looked at the town of New Paltz, for example, which had um, 148 of those wholly exempt properties on them. Uh, they were, uh, had an assessed value of $547 million. And they received exemptions, enjoyed exemptions uh, of up to $16 million in, in ta tax benefits. And then we came to the last page and looked at the IDAs. And at that time, in 2013, there were 25 projects. They represented $90 million of assessed value. And uh, they were forgiven a total, an aggregate total of over $3 million in um, both school taxes, town taxes, and county taxes. And specific to New Paltz, the town of New Paltz, including the village, there are four IDA projects, or there were four IDA projects at that time when we did the first report, and they represented uh, $40 million in assessed value, and um, $1.2 million was forgiven in school, uh, county, and town taxes. So you could understand when you start putting the numbers together and you start looking at it, and you, you start flipping through it and go town by town and see the impacts uh, that we're, we're all being faced with, you, you understand um, that somebody has to make up that difference. You also have to understand that in IDA projects, uh, for every million dollars that's spent in construction costs, there's about another $40,000 of that million that's forgiven in, in our sales tax. And really what that translates into is money that eventually ends up or finds its way back to the towns and the city of Kingston and a sales tax sharing agreement. So there's impacts all along the way, no matter which way we turn. Um, but that doesn't mean that we feel that IDAs are bad. Um, and that doesn't mean that there's not a place for them. And I think after looking at IDAs throughout the entire state of New York, and we work very closely, by the way, on our report um, with the Office of the State Controller, who was very helpful. And uh, to, to, to give you some insight, we had an intern who spent the summer working on our IDA report with us, and she was finishing up her master's at Princeton University. She was, uh, her name was Rachel Van Cleve, and she was a welcome addition to our office, too, did a lot of the, the statistical analysis and a lot of the groundwork. Um, I think what you'll find, and, and, and Joe will, will share that with you, is there are, you're going to hear a lot of words tonight um, uh, when it comes to IDAs, and you need to pay a lot of attention. You're going to hear words like job creation. You're going to hear words like job retention. You're going to hear words like best practices. But you're going to also hear two words that came to light in our report as well, and those two words are but for. And, and that's sometimes how we want to look at a project. You know, and, and all of us, you know, but for the IDA, would that project happen? And that's something, that's a question that we raise too. So that being said, I'm going to turn it over to Joe, but before I do, I, I, I really need to tell you how impressed I am with the current Ulster County IDA. I, I will tell you that I think if you line them up against many IDAs throughout New York State, they are close to being the gold standard 
Now that doesn't mean they're the greatest, I'm gonna tell you that, but I, I said if you line them up other up against other IDAs. Of against New York the State. wall, Elliot? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but I, I will also say this to you, um, that the Ulster County IDA was very cooperative in this report. Um, we shared it with um, um, Mike Kordisky. Um, the Ulster County IDA is a gold standard, but for the other IDAs. Well, no, no. and there's those two words. That, there's those two words that come back. I, I'll leave you this though, and and my uh, fellow uh, uh, college alum and good friend, um, the New York State Controller Tom DiNapoli, has um, begun to focus on authorities such as uh, industrial development agencies. Uh, Tom has committed his next uh, four years. As, his term in office to really look at a lot of these economic development incentives and see where they are and how they line up. So I think we have a willing partner in looking at this, and I'll, I'll turn it over now to my deputy controller, Joe Ariel, who will really drill into the report. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Many of you know me. I'm, I'm Joe Ariel. I'm a deputy controller of the county, and I've also done a little work in and around uh, the village and town. Of um, uh, I, I, I will tell you that um, I, I also should mention that since it's a public meeting, your board and particular members of your board has been extremely diligent in pursuing I think where Elliot was headed when he got himself in trouble there at the end, um, <laughs> which is to say, if, if IDAs are gonna be in existence, if there's a sense that they can add value and increase the ability to attract import and keep important businesses and jobs in their jurisdictions, and I think there is a general consensus about that, the question is, how do we make them work properly how do we keep them accountable? And where have, has the IDA concept gone off the rails a bit? Because when the IDA concept was first introduced, um, it had a, ver a, a fairly limited scope of the type of projects that, um, that were intended to be induced by them, which is the kind of the term of art that's used. And over time, as often happens, somebody, several somebodies, will get another good idea about how we can increase the scope and, and have it apply to more things. And at that particular moment, it may seem like a great idea. And then what you end up with 20 years later is something that has ballooned a little too much. And I think that's the consensus in the scholarship in this area. And what we really tried to do with the report, what we tried to do with all our reports, is we don't go into it with any bias. We try to go into it saying, where can we extract facts that will illuminate the public discussion. Um, that's our job as an auditing entity, that's our job as a watchdog entity, is to try to get into important public debates and inform them. And that's what we tried to do here. So the report, as Elliot mentioned, is online. If you were lucky enough to get one of our limited copies, you have a copy of it now in hard copy, but certainly go look at it. Many of you, I'm sure, have already looked at it. Um, and I'm not going to, we're not going to go through that report page by page. I've got a set of bullet points that I hope will be useful um, in explaining why we did the report and what we found. Um, the questions posed were, because it was the obvious public debate going on, do the benefits conferred by IDAs create jobs and expand the property base? Or do they give away unnecessary tax breaks to businesses which would locate in their jurisdictions anyway? That's how the question tends to be stated in the public debate. You can argue about whether that is, in fact, a, a, a solidly based question, but that is the question that's been out there. The second question was, assuming an IDA's incentives do play a role in the decision of business owners as to where they locate their projects, is the return to the community worth the tax breaks that they're given? So in other words, even if it's true, that it's an important factor in a business deciding where to locate and where to create jobs, you still have to ask the question, are you balancing the cost benefit properly in terms of the benefit you're giving away uh, in exchange for what's being offered to you? 
And as I said, the purpose of the report was to present the conclusions of recent scholarship and experience in this area on both sides of the IDA debate, inform the debate, and then to offer best practices in consideration of that knowledge that we had accumulated. Because there are, there are government and not-for-profit entities that you know, all day, every day, take a look at these things and have formulated some notions of what the best practices would be. We wanted to bring them to people's attention. So, as to the Ulster County IDA, what Elliot said is true. What your supervisor said is true. <laughs> um, which, which is to say, there seems to be a consensus that something's broken in the IDA concept. And because that's true, you can also say that something's broken in the Ulster County IDA concept. But it is fair to say that the Ulster County IDA has actually implemented some policies and procedures that are in fact superior to others who are still running completely hot wild without even standards in place. But getting beyond that, the question is still how do we make it better? If something's going awry, what do we do to make it better? So let's talk a little bit about the Ulster County IDA real quickly. At the time that we concluded the research on our report, the IDA had 37 existing and three pending projects. Each project was financed by IDA bonds or supported by tax abatements, which as Elliot mentioned, includes not just um, uh, real property tax abatements, but also sales tax abatements, sales tax waivers actually, because they become a pseudo public project, um, and mortgage tax um, exemptions as well, or both of those things, bonds and those benefits. Businesses supported by the Ulster County IDA had created or retained 3,900 jobs. And this is an important fact. I mean, again, we've got to be fair, right? That's 97% of the promised jobs. And I can tell you for certain that that is a number that far exceeds many IDAs um, throughout the state. Um, so they deserve credit for that. Um, because it means not so much that they've done a phenomenal job following up on those projects. They are starting to do a better job of that um, in terms of institutionalizing how they follow up on these promises being kept. But in some ways, it's even more impressive that the number is that high because prior to, these, to institutionalizing these regular checkups, they still had that number. And what that means is that the projects that they were approving they had probably exercised reasonable discretion in approving them because it turned out they gave back the jobs that they said they'd give back. Now, here's the other side of the coin. And as I said when I started, you still have to ask the question whether those jobs would have come anyway, whether they would have stayed anyway. We're not drawing conclusions on that. That's for the public debate. And you have to balance that against the fact that those, benefit, those projects benefited from an aggregate of $4.4 million in tax exemptions. They made $1.4 million, these are estimates, uh, in pilot payments. The net exemptions, $3 million. Um, okay, summarizing the debate. Almost all businesses receiving IDA support create or retain jobs. Researchers, objective research disagrees about whether the IDA support is necessary to create those jobs or whether the jobs would be created or retained anyway. That's the bottom line. Well, I wish I had something better to tell you. There is not a consensus in examining the issue overall. And what that means is, and we come back to our recommendations later, that puts the onus on the IDA and the public to on a project by project basis ask the right questions. Because I suspect that the lack of consensus in this area is reflective of the fact that some projects do and some projects don't. And that's why you got to do your homework when you're deciding which ones to approve. Um, there were two New York studies conducted in the 90s. The results differ, but they do show that somewhere between one-third and three-quarters of IDA tax breaks seem to have been instrumental in creating or retaining jobs. Now, if you know your percentages, that's pretty widespread. So once again, it's not, like we're, it's not like we're really honing in all that much, and it shows you the difficulty of conducting studies 
after the fact. And all it does is point once again to the importance of doing your due diligence when you're in the process of approving these projects. Um, one interesting thing, just as a, as a point of reference, is that um, studies have shown that tax levels, in other words, the, the, the general level of taxation in a jurisdiction, so let's say New York, um, and tax abatement are more likely to influence a business's choice between neighboring municipalities than between two states. What that means is that the tax structure one state to another overall is much more likely to determine where a business locates. Um, and, and, and they will have already made that choice when they walk in your door. Um, so you really are talking about whether they go into your municipality or a neighboring municipality. That's an important point because it raises another aspect of the IDA debate, which is that overall for the economy, for the regional economy, for the state economy, there's a growing sense that even if the IDAs are good for a particular county, overall, they do, all they really do is redistribute where these businesses are and hurt one place while they help another. Um, now, to be fair, um, your elected representatives, your jurisdictional IDA, you yourself as an individual trying to make ends meet, you can make an argument that our job is to protect our own. So again, we make no conclusions on how heavily you should weigh that factor, the altruistic factor of the overall public good, but it's something worth considering. Um, all right, so to jump to best practice review, um, first of all, the best practices that we identified generally come from our review and consideration of policies put forth by the Government Finance Officers Association, which is the major um, uh, professional organization for municipal economics and finance. The New York State Economic Development Council, which essentially represents IDAs, the Office of the State Controller, and the New York Authority's Budget Office. Both of those last two entities have pending state legislation which would modify um, and, and codify some of the best practices that we're talking about here. So one of the things I would urge you to do is go look for that legislation. It, it's referenced in the report, you'll be able to find it, and comment on it, because the, the two bills are not the same. If we were to give our you know, sub, uh, subjective opinion on each bill, I guess I, I should say if I would, I don't like the, every provision of each bill. They're not the same. You should weigh in on that, um, just as an aside. Um, or lobby somebody to put in a better bill. Uh, but both bills do incorporate many of these concepts and would make it required statewide for IEAs to adopt these policies. And one point I should make about our interaction with the Ulster County IDA chair, one of his reactions to the report, which overall his, his reaction was that it was a fair report, and I don't think he disagreed with a substantial portion of it, but he did say something that made some sense coming from the mouth of the IDA chair, which was that some of these best practices recommendations, including the but-for test, which we'll talk about, he's not necessarily opposed to them, the problem is that if all IDAs don't have to take them into account, it's further hurting us in terms of competition. So if you're the IDA chair and your job is to try to encourage projects which have the benefits you've been asked to try to garner, it makes sense that you would be concerned about that. So that, I only mention that as a way of saying that there are, it, we can't be too dogmatic about saying because it's a good idea you know, why isn't it happening? There are reasons for why it may not be a good idea right here, right now in Ulster County. I'm not saying that that's the way it should go. It may not be a good enough reason not to do it. Um, but that's just one of the comments that we heard and that should be taken into account. Um, okay. The other thing I'll say about best practices is when we use the term best practice, when it's used properly in any professional endeavor, what it means is that there's been a general consensus among professionals and scholars in the field that these are good ideas. 
as I said when I started, what, what it means to you as a municipality, what it means to an IDA, is, is up to you in terms of how you now engage in that debate. What makes sense for your community and your IDA? Because it's not a one-size-fits-all concept. And an IDA operating in rural Indiana may not want to consider the same best practices as we ought to be considering here. So let's just, let's dive in. Um, remarkably, one of the best practices is to establish project selection criteria. I say remarkably because it means if you have to say that, you can assume there are some IDAs operating in New York State without these criteria. You will be pleased to know that the Ulster County IDA is not one of them. In that sense, they are, again, ahead of the curve. But you are also, most of you, very well informed about what I think many of you view as deficiencies and what those criteria are. And in particular, when it comes to certain types of projects, like residential projects, dormitory projects, or senior projects, I do believe there is a lack of clarity, a lack of criteria, um, even weighed against the criteria for other projects in the Ulster County IDA's um, uh, uh, criteria. So that is something I think very much worth pursuing and I believe your board is very much on top of that. Um, support only projects which will likely not proceed but for IDA assistance. Um, again, this is sort of a I don't even know what the right number is now. $100 million question, $64 million question. It used to be a game show, right? But I'm, I'm out of touch. Anyway. Well, um, New Pulse is a $25 million question. That's a great job. <laughs> that's a great job. <laughs> right? um, OK, so again, I don't want to belabor this too much. I've talked about it already. But the idea is that if a project would go forward anyway, obviously you can make the argument that there's no reason and not just go forward, but go forward in your jurisdiction and create the same number of jobs. Frankly, it would seem irresponsible to be given tax abatements to that entity just because they can tick all the boxes in the state law. By the way, both state proposed laws would introduce this standard. So your, your, your state controller, uh, the budget office, they're on this. Um, and, uh, and as I mentioned again, it would be, the best way to introduce this practice would be to do it statewide. So again, I encourage you to weigh in on that at the state level if that matters to you because there will be an imbalance if only some boards do it. Um, consider whether projects will compete with existing local businesses. It seems to us that there ought to be at least some discussion of whether we're just engaging in poaching. Um, county to county, but also on Main Street. You know, in other words, are we giving an unfair advantage to a project that's going to provide the same service or the same industry that an entity two doors down um, is providing and didn't have the benefit of those abatements? That's at least a question that should be asked. It may not be enough to keep from doing it. In hard times, you, if you want to spur on economic development, you may still decide that you want to do it, but it's a question that ought to at least be asked and investigated. Um, perform a cost-benefit analysis as part of the project approval decision. The UC IDA does this, and many IDAs, most IDAs do this on some level. But one point that we make is that most IDAs also use um, a system, a software basically that's been developed, I think by Cornell, um, called Inform Analytics. One of the things that the Inform Analytics um, program does not do is it does not estimate the cost of increased government services due to the new economic um, development. Whether that's, in the case of residential, that's in, in particularly important because you're gonna have emergency services, you'll have it in any business, but certainly with residential, you're gonna have a lot of government costs associated with that. The Inform Analytics program does not analyze that. We believe it's a serious flaw. We believe, if I may pat our office on the back, that we may be the only entity that's pointed that out in all of this public debate and scholarship. So we believe there ought to be something specific that does that analysis. 
Um, verify the information presented in the application. Again, this sounds axiomatic, well, uh, of course, right? But here's what we mean by that. Mm -hmm. Applications will say, we will ask applicants to put forward information that confirms the data that they're suggesting, that they're representing. IDAs are not typically equipped in terms of their professional background or just the amount of data that they've got available to them to actually vet that information. And I'm not suggesting that, that professionals who have their license on the line are gonna come in and tell out and out lies. In fact, as one of those professionals, I will tell you that in my experience, they almost never do. But that's also not to say that there's not a way of casting information that looked at through a different prism may not look different. And so what we mean by that is, IDA should be taking advantage of independent professionals, perhaps funded by escrows established by the applicants, to do their own analysis of this material, to, to, to test whether it's true. Um, provide for the recapture or termination of benefits um, when projects fall short of their goals. Um, um, I'm just going to yeah. interrupt you because the, you left out a really important sentence in the paragraph in Best Five yep. about second businesses are incentivized not to inflate capital. Businesses are incentivized not to inflate capital investments estimates because they pay a percentage of their estimates as a fee to the UCIDA. Right. Do you just want to talk for just a quick second yeah, about well, the fact that I mean they get paid by the companies that? Right. Well, one could argue that the check in the system for applicants not overstating what, or not overpromising, is that their, the fee they pay as part of the application process is, is based on the amount of benefit they promise, or that they will receive, which is also based on the size of their project and the promises they make. I, I, I should have followed that up by saying, that is a modest test at best. I mean, in other words, I'm not sure it's sufficient as a check. Well, it's also two-sided because it's also the money that they get so they can continue to do the work that they do. Exactly, so right. And, and so, again, we put it in there because it's, a, it's an argument made. We do not find it compelling. And so thank you for pointing that out. Um, okay, so recapture provisions have been included in UCIDA project benefit agreements since early 2013. Um, that's... They're, they're ahead of the curve on, in, in many ways on that uh, as compared to many IDAs. Um, but it's a part of their standard agreement, which to my, as far as I understand, they, they do not negotiate away. Um, so that's good news. Um, always you want to be diligent about whether we're pursuing them and whether our ability to monitor the projects is sufficient. Right now it's essentially one very hard working person in the county office building who goes and looks at these projects on a regular basis and depends largely on reports given to her by them. So, and again, I don't want to suggest that there's any, I'm not, it's not a, uh, an argument of, I mean, that's how most things are done. The question is, how do we make it better? How, how do we tighten it up? What more information can we get? Um, okay, uh, and monitor the, the assisted projects. As I just said, the UCIDA staff visited every project in 2013 and requests employment information annually. Now, I do some of what's left here, and I'll be very brief at this point. Some of it mirrors the best practices that we talked about, but there are some things that our office suggested that are not necessarily related to these best practices that we think um, will be, would be helpful. Um, we do believe that projects should only be uh, induced uh, if they would not proceed, but for IDA assistance. Um, we think that the questions asked as part of the application project or uh, process could be more detailed. We do believe that um, there should be, as I said, the use of independent professionals working for the IDA to vet certain information. We recommend that all retail and service projects require evidence that the project will not draw customers away from existing Ulster County businesses. Market studies would provide such evidence. Now, again, we're not suggesting that if you can show that somebody would choose Burger King instead of McDonald's, they're not eligible for the benefits. Obviously, choice is part of the process, and frankly, as we all know, or most of us know, some competition is good for both businesses. 
Um, the point is to ask the question to do a market study that shows whether the IDA inducement, whether the benefits provided provide an unfair advantage to that person. In other words, can they charge substantially less for their cheeseburger as a result? So that's something that we recommend for retail and service projects. Um, I'll skip, you got the document, so I don't want to belabor the point, but um, there's a pilot points calculator used by the UCIDA, which is good in the sense that it's objective. It has certain categories. You get certain points for certain levels of benefits that you're going to provide to the community. But we believe that that calculator should only give points for jobs, which it has been determined would not be created but for the IDA assistance. So for instance, if it's an expansion of an existing business, or if the amount of the expansion is dependent on the amount of the abatement given, then that corresponding increase in jobs is what you should get credit for, not the total job count. Um, we've talked about the informed analytics thing. I think it's extremely important that it also include analysis um, of the municipal services. Uh, we have several recommendations in the report for maximizing public access to the information. As we prepared this document, we talked to many people. One of the things we heard is that it was hard even for public officials at times to get um, up-to-date reports on what had happened at the IDA meetings, to get copies of minutes. Um, it's not to suggest we know for a fact that they're keeping these copies, that ultimately they are available. But in general, we make several recommendations about regular reports to the county legislature, um, posting all the information online, uh, requiring that it be submitted by the applicants in a form that facilitates it being put online immediately so they're not overburdening the agency, et cetera, et cetera. Um, televising or recording the IDA meetings uh, and several, um, several such recommendations. Um, we think it may be worthwhile to consider a scoring category for local support or opposition um, in the pilot points calculator. It, you know, as, as you know, New York has a, a long and among the 50 states, one of the strongest histories of municipal home rule. And although ID, county IDAs operate in the county interest, and to some extent you can make a good argument that they ought not to be ruled by the local interest, because they have a different scope of interest. It certainly ought to be taken into account, and we think taken into account in a way that is, is represented on the record, something that they have to gauge. Um, and, and we think that's an important thing that uh, ought to be main part of the objective record. Um, we think that school district approval uh, and local approval ought to be obtained where residential projects are under consideration. Because in that area, and, and by the way, there's an entirely other debate about whether any kind of residential project should even be considered, which is also talked about in our report. I can tell you that when the IDA concept was first introduced, not only was it not considered, I, if I'm not mistaken, this goes back a ways, there was language in there that made clear you couldn't do it because it doesn't typically come with an identifiable job creation component. Now, that's, I'm not sure you want to expressly eliminate that because perhaps you could have a project that could come in and make a pitch to you that they are gonna create jobs for whatever reason. But if it's a residential project, we all know that that comes with unique challenges for, for municipal services. And in that case, we believe that the municipality and the school district should have a seat at the table during the approval process. I will tell you that in Westchester County, and for some reason it's the only county in the state legislation that has this, they just must have paid more lobbyists when the IDA law was first adopted. Westchester County has a provision that requires school district approval for every IDA project, every project. And as a person who practiced law down there for a little while, I'll tell you that this is how those meetings went. How does the school district feel about it? We're very happy to have the project. We want 100% of the money. And, and, and that's how that meeting went. You couldn't get out of the meeting unless you agreed to it. Um, so, in residential projects, we think that's important. I mentioned that the dormitory and senior living criteria is, is not equal. Not existent. It's, well, it's not existent, yes. It has no 
specific criteria as every other category does in the Ulster County IDA regulations. Um, that has to change. Especially because, as we just discussed, on those two types of projects, there's an even greater risk that you're giving something away for nothing. So um, we think that's important. Uh, and the last thing I'll say, and um, uh, Legislator Wishnick is here tonight, um, and I, I do want to give him uh, credit because this is something that he made very clear to us as we were preparing the port as something he believed was important. We agree. Um, there's language in the UCIDA, um, boy, for some reason, UTAP, the, the Uniform Tax Exemption Policy which is what we've been talking about, that talks about the discretion of the board. But as written, it seems to be suggested that that discretion can be exercised even when the objective criteria would lead you to another conclusion. And to be more clear, let's say your objective conclusion based on all your tests, your pilot point calculator and everything, leaves you somewhat underwhelmed as far as the benefits of the project. So you can ignore it. it. Well, you can use your discretion right, which um, means ignore to, it. to determine that nevertheless the project is worthy of approval. Now, again, as some of the attorneys in the room will tell you that in order to support a discretionary decision like that, you're supposed to have a record that shows why you did that, and that's a whole other argument in a particular case. But one of our recommendations is that the language of that UTEP should be modified to make clear that actually that discretion, because I don't know that that discretion is necessarily a bad thing. We want thinking human beings. And I'm not sure that any objective calculator can be developed that you'd really want to rely on 100% and say, oh, yep, they win or they lose. I don't know if I love that either. But the policy should be rewritten to make quite clear that that discretion can also be exercised in the other direction. That despite the fact that this objective criteria comes up to a score of you know 10, and that's good, um, that board ought to be able to use its discretion to listen to the public debate, et cetera, and, and exercise that discretion in one direction or another. Again, always with the caveat that it must be supported by evidence in the record. It can't just be a willy-nilly decision, or as we say in the law, arbitrary and capricious. But you ought to at least, as a public member of the public, know that that board isn't bound to give certain benefits or certain levels of benefits just because some system that Cornell dreamed up gives them a 10 instead of a 9. Um, so that's, that's a recommendation in there as well. Um, again, the, the, the report is substantial. Um, I, I, would, I would never want to take up so much of your time as to go through it point by point, but that, I hope, is a decent overview of the conclusions we came to, and I hope you're sure. to Joe, I have a couple questions for yeah. you. It seems to me, from what you're saying, is that we're going to be creating a huge bureaucracy, a new bureaucracy at the IDA level. You talked about the problems they have with really measuring whether or not there's true job creation or retention. You know, it's more of a nebulous thing. There's no empirical data you can point to. So you have all these problems. You have the IDA members that can ignore data and do their own thing. Why is it that we are giving up real property taxes at all? Why don't, why don't, why doesn't the state just give these people better low cost financing in the form of state finance bonds, give them their sales tax and their mortgage tax? Why do they need a real property tax exemption? Why do they even need it? Why should anyone not support schools? Why should anyone in our community, in our, in our country, be able to be free of that responsibility? It makes no sense to me. So I think they should dump the whole process when it comes to real property taxes, let them keep their sales tax and mortgage taxes, and have the state give them lower cost loans that make the project more affordable. Don't put the burden on the community. So I think that should be the discussion rather than creating this huge administrative exercise right. to try to figure out whether they're doing the right thing, whether they made the right decisions, and then to monitor it in the future. Right. It seems that we're going the wrong way. It, it's an extremely salient point, 
And, and all I will say is, as I said at the outset, our report sort of went at it from the perspective that there are IDAs. This is going on right now. They're in operation. And there doesn't seem to be on the horizon, you know, any uh, immediate effort to shut them down. And that being the case, we, we, you're right, we did focus on how to make their practices better. But I will not deny that that is a really valid and, point, and, and that may be something worth lobbying for in an entirely different And I think realm. when you look at what you just described as your best practices, what we're facing here is a Wilmerite project that doesn't meet any of those criteria. All right? Support only for projects that will likely not proceed without assistance. Well, Wilmerite first applied for the, their, their ability to build their project here before there was any discussion about a pilot for real property taxes. There was a discussion about sales tax and mortgage tax, so they went ahead and, and, and applied for this project before there was any discussion. So they were prepared to finance the project without tax exemptions, real property tax exemptions, at least initially. Consider competition with other businesses to avoid poaching. Well, that obviously wasn't done. A cost-benefit analysis, that wasn't done. Um, verify information in their application, they wouldn't even share their pro forma with us. So, in my mind, Wilma Wright hasn't even satisfied one of the best practices. So that's from Wilma Wright's side. From the ID's perspective, I, I know that you're counting the IDA and you're talking about the quality and character of the people we have on our board and they're a gold standard. I have to disagree. I am really seriously disappointed with people sitting up there in Kingston and ignoring the will of the public. And, and, and putting a burden on us that we are already beyond being able to, to, to uh, satisfy. I mean, you talked about your report on the tax exemptions. You know, we have five or six hundred million dollars off and they're, they're putting more on us. So, the IDA established this category five for some unknown reason. So, you're talking about discretion? They decided to put Wilma Wright as a senior, uh, as a dormitory project into a category that gave them benefits well beyond the existing categories. And there's no rationale for it. There's not one single piece of rationale for it. There was no proof they needed it. There was no proof that they needed the, the benefit from a, from a financial point of view. There's nothing. So how can that be a gold standard? Um, would it be pop possible also just because we have limited time to open it up for the public? Well, uh, no, well uh, it's first uh, let the board have a chance to talk and then I will open it to the public. But okay. I know Kevin has questions and yes. I have so, a question or two, so, so, but the public will. I, I mean, I'm highly critical of the IDA and what they did and I'm very suspicious about why they did it. And, and that's why we have foiled the legal bills for Harris Beach from the county. I want detailed legal bills for Harris Beach from 2010 to the present to see exactly what they were retained to do. They were retained by the county to help the county with the Golden Hill Project. And so the Golden Hill Project led to the creation of a Category 5 to help finance the Golden Hill Project and encourage a third party buyer. How Wilmerite snuck into that, I want to find out about. Now, if you can help us, we've <laughs> foiled that, those documents three times now, and we're only getting a couple of bills, when I say a couple, maybe three quarters out of four years of billing from Harris Beach. So if you can help us get that, I would like to see the connection between Harris Beach and our IDA. Okay. All right, so thank you for your time, but I think we should redirect this conversation in another way. Let everybody pay for schools. Let everybody pay for you know our community expenses. They shouldn't be exempt from that. Let the state do it another way. Okay. All right. well, I happen to agree with everything Kevin said, but going back to your specific recommendations, mm -hmm. um, number four, where you talk about you know this calculator and giving points only for jobs which would not be created but for the IDA, but in the category five that was created, they don't even look. At right. job creation, and, and I, I, that's right. And I would suggest that it may that it, it may be their undoing. Although we suggest that they obviously resolve that, but 
before they approve yeah, the again guy. as you <laughs> approved it. And did they explain that to you to add to suit? Did well, they explain why they no. did that? And and it's lawyer talk, but the well, Kevin's fact, a lawyer, so he'll yeah. understand you. The so fact <laughs> that there's no criteria in there, as you may know, Kevin, may actually be the thing again. If you're operating without objective criteria, then the exercise of your discretion is subject to the proof you had on the record. And if you're convinced that that proof will be But you don't need a record if there's no criteria. No, well, again, it's not. A, yeah. It's a conversation we can have yeah. offline, but I understand what you're saying. And, okay. And, and then just, just very quickly, on um, when you say on number nine, considers requiring school district approval for residential projects, I think it's really important that you add in school district and municipal approval, because in our particular case with Wilmerite, it is a residential right. project. But the impact is on the town. It's on the police services right. and the emergency services. Yeah. It's not necessarily on the school district right. to the level of the town. And quite frankly, this town board put the benefits that the town could get and denied taking them on behalf of the school district. And if the project should get approved and we should lose the lawsuit, we're going to be hurt in terms of what we get for the police while the school will, in essence, benefit from the work that we've done, in you're, a sense. So correct. I would really like for number nine for your recommendations to include municipal approval. Thank you. So, is um, Jeff? Do you have anything you want to ask or say? Or no, I, I just think uh, you know, and Joe and, and Ellie, thank you very much because I know this took a lot to put together. So we appreciate you coming. Uh, I just think the one part of the the but for test is great. I'm just not buoyed by the argument though from Mike Kordinsky, and I'm glad he was able to sit with you guys. And I, don't, I think that's great. He met with you and gave you information. And I think that's a good dialogue, and hopefully that continues with your office and with Mike and, and his staff. But I'm not at all feeling that there's, by saying that, if we take these and I do these, and I, and I say that as Mike Kordinsky, is, as you just reported, would say, is his of his take on this is, well, we can do these, but you know what, other county and other IDAs aren't doing them, so we really shouldn't do them. Well, that's up there along the lines of, you know, Nike can say, well, you know, we really should go to a third world or developing nation and pollute their environment and... So uh, we can compete uh, with everybody uh, yeah. else. So we can then be, compete with everyone else and be better, or, or actually have and make more profit. So the, the argument, Mike's argument, I have to, you know, I, I have to say, I don't think that's a good argument at all. If the system needs to be changed here. Uh, also, I, I do want to, I will read through all of this, but just looking at your best practices, uh, I would also like to see maybe if somewhere in here, if we could also put in that, you know, an IDA would certainly benefit if not using uh, the local uh, impact statement, especially the part of the, you know, the environmental impact statement, using the fiscal portion of it, the FEIS, but maybe even requiring their own FEIS. And I don't believe that would be a tremendous burden. Uh, you know, you're talking about because they would limit that scope to the things that matter to the IDA. To the IDA, yeah. exactly, and also at the county level, mm -hmm. an FEIS for them, and it wouldn't be that burdensome again because it would be it would be much more of a drill down, and also the economics of it would not be that expensive to the applicant because I'm guessing what, what's the average value of an IDA application. About. Oh, no, I wouldn't uh, want to guess. I it's in the millions, though, usually, right? It's, these aren't it's usually not worth the effort, frankly, if it's not in the millions. Right, so exactly. It's not worth the effort of, of input into it. So I don't think asking an applicant to do a separate one for them. Uh, I, I was absolutely appalled and, for lack of a better word, disgusted that I had to sit there in the chambers and watch them take our FEIS. Uh, and their lawyer tell them, well, basically what I did is I took out uh, about a page and a half of what New Paltz said was important to them and their impacts. I removed those, and here's a 70-page document that I'm presenting to you now. I'd like you now to approve it. Uh, and they did. And they did. They sat minutes. there in front of us, and they approved it without reading. They didn't let reading. us talk about it either. Uh, mm -hmm. And as Susan will tell you, this board here, uh, we won't approve a, uh, you know, I, I will give the example we're going to be doing uh, a piece on the Pilgrim Pipeline, and uh, we've all been looking at a three-page document for days now. Uh, so we won't even do a three-page without reviewing it for days and having right. input on it. And I was embarrassed by our own county, you know, a, the IDA sat up there and approved a 70-plus page document without ever reading it or seeing it. And I think your point is great. I think actually having it more focused and more drilled down 
just to the county impacts. Right. And, and it wouldn't be a large document, maybe, and it, and it also might help. So. But I appreciate it. Thank you very much for so doing all the work that you've done. No, I, I want to give the, the okay. public opportunity to speak, but I did want to thank you guys so much for coming out. Okay. It's really so appreciated. I know it was hard okay. to work out. So first, first, um, I just wanted to first, I was going to acknowledge that also County Legislator Ken Wishnick is here. I just, you now acknowledged it beforehand. So I'll start with you, Ken, and then we'll sort of, can everybody put up their hand who wants to talk just so I can control this in a way? <laughs> okay, this is, what, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to start, I'm, it's going to be easier for me if I start with Kitty and I'm just going to go down the rows. Otherwise, I'm going to lose track of how I'm getting people to talk. So Kitty, why don't you start? Oh, okay. Um, thank you. This, this is a wonderful turnaround from the controller's office. Um, when oh, okay, so do you need microphones? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Kitty, I'm sorry, Kitty, Kitty actually. Give the microphone and we'll try to have them pass it around. I just want to thank the Comptroller's Office because I think in the past um, most of our elected public officials in a title like Comptroller have just kind of gone with the flow and said if it has the words economic development in it, it must be good. And I just can't thank you enough for taking a much harder look at it. The thing that has always frustrated me about IDAs is that First of all, I don't know exactly where the money goes that they collect. I, I've never, I mean, they say they don't have staff. Um, apparently, they do have one staff person, but that fee that they collect, I've never understood where that goes, and maybe that's answered in your report. Um, when Crossroads was coming to New Paltz six years ago, um, I talked a lot to the people in the Ulster County um, personnel department to try to find out how many real jobs had been created as a result of previous IDAs. And the woman that I spoke to said, well, we really have no idea. It's all self-reported. And I don't know if that's changed, but if the one staff person that you've mentioned is actually, I know you said that the IDA have gone to actually inspect the jobs, but do they actually look at the payroll books? Does anybody look at the payroll? Now, now we do. Okay, and say, you promised us 37 full-time jobs and there are 37. That does happen now? Okay, that's good to know. Um, and the other thing, of course, is that the temporary versus permanent jobs, we all know that during the construction there's a, a big surge in jobs, but how many actually remain? And um, I, I think that, I don't know if you've broken it down, but um, you know, we've seen studies where the actual calculation of the benefit can often mean that taxpayers are essentially granting a $200,000 tax break for a $14,000 job. And I don't know if you've ever been able to match the value of the tax break against the salaries and the benefits. Are these full-time jobs? Are they benefited jobs? Um, so that if, say, the value of the tax break is $200,000, how many people are employed and getting benefits for that? Um, if it's not in your recommendations, maybe there's a way to add those things. And again, I, I'm so grateful to you for starting this process. Who wants this next? Can, can you um, just, do you know the answer to Kitty's question about what they do with that money that they collect? I, I believe it goes to fund, the, the fee itself goes to fund the operation of the but, IDA. But there is no, but there's really no budget for the, I mean it's volunteers that come, it's well, somebody I, who's on. I can only talk to you about. Oh, you need to use the microphone for the TV. I can only talk to you about what it was uh, prior to the uh, shift, but. Um, that fee actually went to the Ulster County Development Corporation, who was paid to oversee the Ulster <coughs> County IDA, and it was a very bizarre relationship that no longer exists. Exist. So we know it no longer exists, but right. um, but then would you be able to try to Absolutely. go to the next step and vet out? Let us know. I mean, we'd like you know actually we should see how much money they've earned. And what they're doing with that money. I know they give some money to the Woodstock Film Festival. I know they give some money to a couple of not for profits, but outside of that, where's that money? Okay, thanks. Can um, can somebody hand this to Ira? Answer some of that question. Okay, can you come uh, take? You have to take the microphone. Can you come here? You go over there. <laughs> Although not uh, fully disclosed and, and fully known. Uh, 
I will share here tonight that I learned within the, uh, the last two weeks that some of the money that the IDA collects is available for local economic inducement grants with virtually no criteria other than it being the economic development. They currently have in the pot $200,000 that can be spent on a project if someone applies for it. The uh, standards for it essentially uh, there, uh, there are none, as I said, other than economic development. And in addition to, uh, uh, to that, I'm also told that uh, Suzanne Holt, the administrator of the program, uh, she vets it to determine if it's eligible and then it goes to the board, the board approval. And so with that information, I'd certainly like to encourage our community to consider developing um, an economic development related project <laughs> to uh, attempt to take care of that money since there has been no publicity on the availability of those funds that, uh, that I'm aware of that's, uh, uh, that's uh, you know, first in there. Uh, I'm also told that they do in fact provide certain kinds of grants on occasion for water, sewer, gas lines, and things of, uh, of that nature, including funding of feasibility studies that, again, need to be uh, applied for. And so there are funds, there's some, a big amount of funds available to them. Uh, their uh, funds are virtually unlimited for, uh, for legal fees as needed, and we hope they, uh, uh, they get that cap pretty soon by losing their lawsuit. <laughs> Uh, but nonetheless, uh, it, is, uh, it is something that is worthy of, uh, in my opinion, a control audit, and possibly that could be uh, done to see what happens with, with all of that, extending beyond what was done. And, uh, and there are opportunities to uh, take back and benefit our community from what's already there. The other thing I want to spell out uh, is that the one person who was it Who's, who's charged with administering uh, has now expanded to, uh, to three people who uh, have responsibilities. It's grown. They've just added a new person who has been teaching in college and has an MSW degree and had worked for a fashion magazine, I'm told, in the recent presentation to our Economic Development Committee. Not yet met this individual and also someone who's on loan from the uh, uh, executive's uh, department. I do think this is an area that needs uh, a lot more focus, and it's only through a lot more focus that I think the, uh, the community is going to get what it should be getting from this type of organization. Thanks, Ken. Thank you, um, Ken. Can somebody, can you just hand this to Ira? And then if you could pass it around, and if at um, a certain point it doesn't reach, we'll have to ask people to come up Thank you. Um, this is great listening to this because gentlemen are confirming what those of us who have been against this project have been saying all along. Um, let me comment that a couple of things that I think that they should look into. I mean, I like to throw the term economic development around and creating jobs. And I know I was told I don't understand economics, but I don't understand how taking money from me to give to somebody else is economic growth more than just income redistribution. Uh, uh, Kevin's plan about paying your basics, that makes sense. You know, the, the state, you know, it's, it's like uh, tax-free New York. State isn't paying for this. The people, and particularly the people in New Pulse will be paying for this because somebody's got to pay for all of this stuff, and it's not the state. It should be paid for by the state. And, and the interesting thing is, is that these ideas that they're coming up with, none of which were followed, in my opinion, by this IDA in terms of the college attempting to steamroll the town. When you want to talk economic development, maybe you experts who understand economics better than I do can, under, can tell me how us paying for all the services and necessary things for the college 
in the town, and the jobs going to the village is economic development for the town. The, the, the college has deliberately misled. I mean, this is the gentleman said, nobody checks their facts. If it wasn't for the town board and, let's say, the police commission, they would have gotten away with it's only going to cost us $1,600 a year more for the police. I mean, the, 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 what these gentlemen are saying is a good idea, but it's got to be implemented and it's got to be enforced. You can't let a bunch of people who are politically um, determined to do something for whatever the benefit to them is hurt people. I mean, I guess maybe I look at terms of, uh, uh, as I've said, the, the college is going to force people, in my opinion, out of their homes because there's only so much you can afford and then only rich people or those that can afford it will be here and people trying to raise their families are going to have to leave. Right? Th th this is not uh, a good idea you know, if it's not covered by the state. It should be, as Kevin said, this should be something, the state wants to do this, they want to run around saying, oh, look how great New York is, look at all the jobs. Fine, that everybody should kick in. I mean, that's the way you do it, that's the proper way to do it. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna ask you to pass the microphone. If I can ask, that, I do know that they have to leave and get somewhere afterwards, so what I'd like to just ask, is we all know how probably most of us feel about the particular IDA project in New Paltz, so if you could really just limit it to like directing questions about the report and asking questions, that would be my preference. Um, only because they don't have a lot of time. And Paul, you might want to use the. You might need to get. And maybe. Uh, maybe getting up is better. Yeah, right there. You know what? Why don't you? Why don't you? Yeah, getting up is better. There we go. Yeah. You okay, Bob? You heard what yeah. I said. Why don't you? Why don't you take that and move it over there? And why don't you? Can this reach? Maybe she can, 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 can This might no. Just see if that hands hands it to Andy. Yeah. I think it might be okay for the moment. Who's gonna? Who has the next question? Paul. Okay, Paul. Can you just come over here? Sure. <laughs> First of all, I, I really appreciate uh, Controller Auerbach and um, the others coming. Thanks to your report, I want you to know that several of us are pushing ahead with people in other counties to follow up on that legislation and to make a part of that legislation to have local IDAs be approved by the school districts and the tax taxing authorities like the town or the village. Your report started some numbers that we shared with the New Paul Central School District and as a result of that, the Legislative Action Committee has now approved recommending to the entire board that they would take a more active role in sponsoring that kind of legislation. So the numbers that came out of the report, what we need in a community from your department is some more math help. It might only be division, but I have one point with regard to your report that came pretty crystal clear to me is when any IDA, and particularly this UCEDA, grants a tax abatement. It's no longer shared by the members of New York State. It's not equally shared by the members of the county. It falls disproportionately on the particular community. Where IDAs should go is Allenville. They want them there. They probably take a tax abatement for a toxic waste dump or uranium. And I'm sorry for that. We don't want them here. So. The math that allows us to, number one, prove that a dollar is not a dollar when it's a tax payment in lieu of tax dollar. We need help in making that calculation. I think your office can do it. Number two, if you take the amount of tax abatements per municipality, we suddenly have to absorb the Wilmerite costs. I'm not, I think Susan's point is well taken. But for example, spread amongst just 4,000 tax parcels. So what is the proportion? Can you help us get the data on the proportion of tax abatements, particularly the real estate, in any township or village or school district amongst those 37 projects? 
it becomes toxic at a certain point. And I think if the Wilmerite project were granted, it would be so many million parts per thousand, or mm -hmm. the way we do with lead and with all those. So <laughs> I'm going to be calling your office to ask for mathematic help. And Elliot, thanks for talking to me, and that's what I wanted to say tonight. Thank you very much. Thanks, Paul. I think the, the IDAs are uh, the wrong way. I think the IDAs should do the research, and they should uh, come to the municipality, and they should try to, uh, to uh, get the municipality to agree with this proposed project. And if the municipality doesn't think it's worth it, that's it. Instead of this top down where they decide that doesn't matter if the municipality doesn't want it, in their infinite wisdom, they're going to push it down our throats. I'm in the school district. Uh, I'm not in the town, but I can feel their pain. I can feel our pain too. So that's the way I think it should be. They do the research and the municipality decides whether it's worth it. That's democracy. We don't have democracy now. What we have is some king decide or uh, a court deciding what's good for us. We know what's good for us. They don't know what's good for us. Uh, who's next? Ken's behind you. And Ira, why don't you come up if you want to talk because the microphone doesn't reach yeah. and we need, uh, need it for the TV. Andy, Ken, 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 Andy, Ken oh, they're going to come again, up. because of time constraints, we can just limit it to questions. I understand. There's uh, one more best practice I'd like to suggest. And that is that when people come out to a public hearing sponsored by the IDA, that the IDA should have an obligation to respond to the points that are raised. I was at uh, an I, the Ulster County IDA board meeting when they, they pointed to a huge pile of paper that they said was the comments with everyone smirking. I have not seen any response document, which is typically required in government. There were many points raised. They told many people, they cut them off, wouldn't them speak, and said submit your comments in writing. When people submit their comments in writing, they're owed consideration. And there should be that best practice requiring that the points that are raised should get a written response in consideration. Can you hand it to Ira? Thanks. Uh, for, to begin with, I, I believe that what was uh, presented shows uh, very clearly why it's necessary to have an office like the controller at the county level uh, be in the hands of uh, an independent uh, official and, a, and an intelligent official, and I'm certainly grateful that both of those uh, qualities are uh, very uh, fully exemplified in uh, uh, w what Mr. Auerbach was uh, te telling us. I would like specifically to suggest uh, another uh, criterion that might um, bring into sharp relief what it takes to uh, see whether a, a a given uh, proposed uh, pilot or any tax exemption should be justified. And that's to go back to the realm of Bible study. You know, in the Judeo-Christian uh, faith, we say, by your deeds shall you be known. Uh, Moses thought that way, Christ thought that way, and uh, it's uh, written in many ways throughout uh, most biblical uh, uh, teachings in other religions. and. Toward that end, if we take a hard look at uh, who or what is uh, putting in an application for a pilot, we look at their history. Do they live up to their previous uh, tax obligations? Do they pay them on time? Uh, do, do they live up to their previous claims in other uh, uh, projects uh, to the effect that uh, they promised a certain number of jobs would uh, materialize? Do they materialize? Uh, are they involved also uh, in environmentally uh, destructive or ecologically irresponsible uh, activity? And if so, that in its own right ought to be uh, sufficient grounds for uh, disapproving of them. So in effect, what I'm suggesting is a kind of historical view as well as a mathematical view or an accounting view of eligibility for pilots. Number one, looking at the track record of outfits that come to a given community and say, we promise you jobs, we promise you economic development, we promise you prosperity, but let's see what the evidence is of what they have done in the past. 
Have they consistently failed to do what they promised? And also I think uh, it's important to look uh, nowadays at uh, the ecological and environmental impacts of what they have done uh, in the past as well. Uh, thank you. That's what I wanted to Hi. Uh, I'm a, obviously a strong supporter of public education because uh, I'm an arithmetically challenged English professor in the state system. Uh, I don't get a sense from your defense of the IDA that you realize the moral damage you've done, or not you, but the whole proposal that uh, for Wilma Wright, because the state university serves the whole state. And therefore, the cost of that should be borne by the state as a whole. And this looks, even to someone who's arithmetically challenged, and I think most people, <laughs> like me, they can get the whole point, that this is a way of slipping in, okay, avoiding any additional tax burden publicly available to the state as a whole, and putting it in at a local level. The state as a whole should support public education. You shouldn't even have brought the concept of, of uh, Wilma Wright and an IDA for it when it involved shifting some of the burden onto a local community. And, and you undermine your moral authority. I've never heard of IDA before. I'm against it. You've lost this battle. Joe and, and Elliot, I just want to say one more thing. Um, you know, it's people like you that develop this conversation that has to be developed more. And, and so without your work, None of this would happen. But this town also needs your support in our effort with this Category 5 fiasco. Okay, We talked about the fact that that whole category is stripped out. So we need your support on that, and we would appreciate that. All right. Before I give this back, <laughs> I, give it to you again. I just want to say that those best practices, you know, the but for, would it go somewhere else, all of those things were challenged time and again at the public hearing that was held in New Paltz. There was documentation of, of, of that this project did not meet any of those standard best practices. And, and then the vote came within a month. So if in your recommendations there could be, as I think uh, Legislator Wishnick said, a response to public comment saying, we don't care, or we disagree, or your you know, reasoning is flawed. But it, it was discouraging to have 350 people stand up and say, it doesn't meet any of your own criteria, and then have the vote go uh, against us. <coughs> we agree. Okay. Um, Thank you, guys. Actually, I'll take Kevin's request a step further. I would like to actually ask if you would be, Elliot, willing to call Tom DiNapoli and see if you could set up a meeting with the state controller and the attorney general for us to possibly go up and meet with them to talk about the creation of Category 5? Not a problem. That's not a problem. Great. I just want to leave you with this. You know, I, when I first sat on the IDA board, I, I held true to the words that it was for industrial development. And, and up until uh, my last, I think, six months on the board, that was the mission of the IDA. Um, and somewhere along the way, there was an off-ramp given, as Joe said, and, and Kevin knows that attorneys are very crafty. Um, <laughs> they can look at things and see things that, that the common folk can't. And all of a sudden, we started to see a rise in, in residential projects. And uh, I, I'm still amazed that that issue hasn't been addressed, that it should go back to its original mission, which was industry focused and, and helping them. So with that, I want to thank you guys. Thank you. Uh, we have to get out of here. Yeah. Go away. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, great. So now what we will do is open it up to public comment. If anybody would like to speak, please go up and uh, speak. <laughs> Um, I attended a uh, forum at the college the other night on Pilgrim Pipeline. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of people in our community who have no idea of what that is. So I just want to talk briefly about it and 
less about all the harm it's going to do, because I'm sure other people are going to talk about it and you're going to hear about that. So Pilgrim wants to say that back in crude oil, through a proposed 178-mile pipeline that would run from Albany to New Jersey and back, and it will run through new parts. Back in crude oil is a product obtained through fracking, has been found by the U.S. Pipeline and Hazardous Material Safety Administration to be among the most dangerous types of oil that can be shipped. Pilgrim and its attorney have actually threatened and intimidated property owners to the point of harassment, even though they have no legal rights to do this, trying to get people to sign off that they can come onto their property <clears throat> so they can do, quote, environmental surveys. And the goals of those wrongful, wrongful factual and legal claims are to falsely induce homeowners to sign away their property rights and chill the opposition to the Pilgrim Pipeline. On Monday night at a forum on the pipeline, one New Paltz resident got up and said she had already signed off with Pilgrim because she thought they would take her house and land through eminent domain and now wants to undo, undo the contract as they lied to her. This is big oil going after small landowners. If they can deliberately lie and misrepresent the facts when it comes to what powers they have, how can you trust them to protect the environment or public safety with this pipeline? How can you trust them to do a proper environmental review of the project or follow safety environmental laws? Now, Pilgrim is an LLC, and that's how they can't be officially connected to the people that they're really connected to, which is the Koch brothers. Pilgrim Pipeline Holdings is headed by company president Errol Boyle and vice president Roger Williams. Both men are former high-ranking executives in Koch Industries, a multi-million dollar conglomerate owned by the brothers Edward and Charles Koch, 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 Koch <laughs> a.k.a. the Koch brothers. The Koch brothers are major supporters of the proposed Keystone Pipeline, which aims to carry Canadian tar sands through the Midwest and U.S. refineries on the Gulf Coast. They have also supported campaigns that deny scientific evidence of man-made climate change on the back of Americans for Prosperity, who last year lost a legal challenge to try to force New York to drop out of the climate change control program meant to reduce power plant emissions of greenhouse gases. In January 2000, Coke Industries was also made to pay the largest civil fine ever imposed under federal environmental law at that time, which was $30 million civil penalty to resolve claims related to more than 300 oil spills from its pipelines and oil facilities in six states. So I'm going to recommend to get more information that you can go to um, www.riverkeeper.org and click on crude oil transport. Um, and you can also get, find more articles about this by just Googling P Pilgrim Pipeline. Um, don't be intimidated. When these, if these people show up at your house, because they have been around in all the towns where they've been, I've seen articles from New Jersey all the way up, they've been go, going around and trying to force themselves on, onto the property and to have you sign over their, your rights for them to come on. Do not be intimidated. Do not sign anything with them. Get your license plates if you can, if they're harassing you. There's a lot more inf info on the dangers of the pipeline, um, such as the compressors they use to move it along, dangerous gases that those compressors um, can emit. Get educated. The health and safety of everyone is on the line. Thank you, Judge. Would anybody else like to speak during public input? Kitty, are you getting up to speak? Oh. I don't know if she's getting up to leave or getting up to speak. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, First of all, thank you again for getting a copy of the searchable 2015 budget up on uh, our town website. I, I guess the thanks goes to Carol Connolly, but it's done. It is a huge improvement and a great benefit to those of us who um, should have better things to do than go through the town budget uh, line by line. But uh, that was a great service, and please tell Carol that we appreciate it. Um, uh, I don't know if you're aware of the ZBA decision the other night which granted the waivers that uh, Wilmerite was requesting. Uh, and in the language of their um, resolution, it said um, that uh, the waivers were only granted provided that the applicant did not deviate from the preferred site plan. However, there was no penalty language or any other kind of uh, explanation of what would happen after Park Point builds its too tall, too wide, too close together buildings and then goes and bulldozes the, the wetlands. So um, I know that they're a completely independent body from yours, but I'm hoping that um, perhaps you could just write to the ZBA and their attorney and just request 
uh, an explanation of how they expect to enforce this um, uh, condition um, because the language of the resolution itself does not contain any uh, provision for what happens if they do deviate. Kitty, did you attend that meeting? Yes. Was there public comment at that meeting? There was no public comment prior. The only public comment that was permitted was on open public hearings. Okay. So we did not have the opportunity to comment on that. And, and yeah. what was disappointing to many of us was that um, the meeting was called at 7 o'clock. Uh, the decision was made at 7.15. Uh, Wilm Wright left the room, happy. <laughs> and, uh, but every other applicant sat at this table for 45 minutes or an hour while the ZBA explained the conditions of their approval. And um, there was no discussion of that with this particular vote. So I, I do think that the ZBA thinks that they have met the responsibility of ensuring that no further uh, harm to the sensitive wetlands or other environmental factors are uh, happen. But uh, you know maybe there is a document somewhere that they had a, another meeting with Wilmerite and Wilmerite signed off on. And if so, it would be great if we could see it. Can, can I ask you to? If it's okay to try to put in writing what you're requesting, like you know your concern, sure. um, because obviously because the ZBA is a separate board, how we deal with it, you know, we've got to be very careful. So if you could put it in writing, that I can take it to one of our lawyers to ask, you know, can yeah. I send this to the ZBA? How do I handle right. this in a way that doesn't sure. put any of us yeah. in any? That would really okay. help. Um, so um, and then I just have a few uh, questions about the budget. Um, the one that's online does not appear to have changed from the original, so I don't know if you've made any changes. So the only change is um, on the cover sheet, and that has to do with how much we raise in taxes versus how much fund balance we use. Okay. But there were no changes but to all the... all the lines are, yeah. are unchanged. Okay. Yeah. So um, I noticed that the supervisor's line went up $6,000, the justices went up 14000 this is um, salaries. And again, I come back to the, the budget personnel line. Um, I understand the need for more help in the budget office, and I am asking that you uh, do hire the third person that um, our bookkeeper has requested, but that you hold off on hiring a controller. <coughs> and I think tonight we had I couldn't ask for a better example of why we need an elected controller because our Ulster County controller has said some things that may not sit well with other executives in Ulster County. Um, but he answers to us and not to them. And the controller or financial officer or whatever the position is that you're um, seeking to create will answer to you and not to us. And so I would like you to wait a year before filling that position. I would like you to reduce line 522-1340-100 by $70,000. Um, give the bookkeepers the extra full-time person they need. And if a year from now you still feel that you need another full-time budget officer, um, you know, let's revisit that in a year. But uh, I just think that that's, you know, to have two new full-time people um, may be more than we need at this point. So I would ask that you um, vote uh, on that line uh, outside of your regular budget vote, and um, I'm hoping that you will vote to uh, reduce that line by $70,000. Um, and you could give some more money to the rail track. <laughs> Thanks, Kitty. Um, Andy, so next. Yeah, I didn't see that. Um, Andy Weiss, Bartzeg in the school district, but uh, living in Gardner. Uh, I think New, New Pulse is uh, up to date on uh, not liking this pipeline, not liking that pipeline. And I think what we need to do is to go to the broader picture, which is why are they spending so much money on uh, uh, fossil fuels, which have to go away. So I think we need to talk about that. Why are these billions of dollars being spent on uh, pipelines and all the other uh, equipment 
when everybody should be figuring out how they can start with or continue with sustainable energy. There's a lot of individual fights that we're doing, but let's start uh, saying what we want, which is not these uh, individual projects for fossil fuels, which are so last year. And if we start talking about that, uh, I think people will understand that these are silly things to do and make our life uh, simpler than having to fight every different uh, project. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I wrote, um, you don't have to get up. Um, was that just hands out? Okay, you can do that. Thank you. Um, actually, I wasn't going to say anything about this, but uh, Kitty kind of reminded me. Um, I was at that ZBA meeting. It's the first ZBA meeting I ever went to. And the only reason I did was because of the uh, Wilmerite uh, request. I asked the chair if there's public comments. She said no. Uh, she also said there's been enough comment about Wilmerite. We don't need any more. Basically, uh, you know, our minds are made up and oh, you're not going to change anybody else's mind. Um, the thing that bothered me was she made it a point to say that they, uh, who they were, I assume, at least three of her committee, because that's the way the vote went down, don't care what the planning board said or, you know, wanted or suggested. My concern about their decision was that if the town planning board in their wisdom, decided that the Wilmerite project, as proposed, was detrimental to the town. Why would your ZBA consider expanding that project, which is what Wilmerite was asking, would not be detrimental to the town? And again, we have been to a ZBA meeting before, but that made no sense to me, and the only thing that went to the back of my mind was when you, people go into court, Wilmerite's going to come in and says, well, wait a minute, the ZBA had no problem with us expanding the problem. Mm -hmm. And I think that put, I, I think for whatever the reason they did what they did, my personal opinion was they put the whole situation into jeopardy. Thank you. Thanks, Ira. Uh, I do think that we also should follow up on the lack of public comment as well. My name is Iris Marie Bloom, and I do want to stick in a, a short comment about the IDA and, and then move on to the Pilgrim Pipeline <laughs> and combine them. Just if there, if there is going, going to be such a thing as an IDA, I don't see why it couldn't have a triple bottom line approach, which is people, which is jobs, economic you know, prosperity, which is economic development, and planet. So the triple P, triple bottom line, there should be uh, criteria around sustainability because we were in an absolute crisis um, with our climate. Uh, so that's just a little bit on the on the IDA. But um, I really came to talk about the Pilgrim Pipeline, and I really am excited that Impulse um, is, I hope, about to pass the resolution opposing Pilgrim Pipeline. Um, and I want to give some really strong reasons for that and ask that you take maybe two more steps beyond that passing of the resolution. Um, so a little bit about why it's so important. Obviously, safety is a huge, huge concern. Uh, there are, for the last 10 years, there have been 631 pipeline incidents per year, according to federal data from PHMSA, the Pipeline Hazardous Material Safety Administration. That's a lot of explosions, fires, leaks, and spills. Um, and just to give one example of a big one in 2012, that was an oil pipeline, an uh, Enbridge oil pipeline, uh, leaked into the Kalamazoo River. I don't know how many of you know about that, but at the time, it was one of the things that was uh, obvious was that people were getting sick. It's a health issue, beyond just a safety issue and an ecological issue. People were getting sick because of the fumes from that oil. That was 843,000 gallons of oil. Uh, fast forward, more than two years later, 80 miles of that river are still affected or closed. There's no life in that river, and uh, they spent two and a half billion dollars on cleanup. And the only way they can actually do the cleanup, which hasn't been done, is by um, removing 80 miles of river bottom. 
It's just unbelievable. So the, you can't overstate the dangers and damages from, from oil pipelines in terms of safety, in terms of health. Also, in terms of safety and health, life and limb, this Bach and Shale oil, when it blows, it blows up into 300 foot tall fireballs. You may have seen the pictures, but that's happened a number of times in the past year, not just in Lac Megantic, but in Lynchburg, Virginia, in Castleton, North Dakota. Um, and when it blows, people have to be evacuated for five miles around. That means 10 miles across. How are we gonna evacuate you know, the I-87 corridor on five miles on both sides? So, um, there's also the climate impact. And to be very specific, you know, we know that fossil fuels are bad in general, but this Bach and Shale uh, fracking is extreme fossil fuel extraction. And it's extremely wasteful, even as fossil fuel extraction goes. They flare, which means they burn off to the sky one third of all the methane that comes up with the oil. They are just burning it up, and the flares are so big that you can see them from outer space. Um, so the climate impacts from that wastefulness is just enormous. Um, in also the air, as, as uh, I think Josh mentioned, the off gas is a danger to local residents. So for all those reasons, plus the bullying of the company, um, I strongly urge you to unanimously pass the resolution. The two steps beyond that, that I would love to see the board do if possible, I don't know if it's possible, but you tell me. Um, I have here copies of the letters that residents can use um, to refuse access to the pipeline corporation um, and also to rescind access if they were so bullied and intimidated that they gave access. I already talked with someone just yesterday who said, yeah, he, he actually wasn't sure if he had signed something or not because he's an older gentleman and he, his memory isn't that great. And he said, oh, I don't want to have anything to do with the pipeline. Pipeline company knocked on his door in Tilson. And uh, he told them verbally, I don't want to have anything to do with you. But when I said, did you sign anything? He said, oh, I'm not sure. Maybe I did. So there's a, there's a document that says, I rescind any agreement that I made with Pilgrim Pipeline giving access to my land. So I don't know if those could be posted I, I think what would, would be nice if it's we're even allowed to do this. I, if we could put that on the town website. Yeah, no, we can. We actually, yeah, I had taken, I had, no, if you can give me this. I got copies on Monday night. Okay. And we will, we will do something. We'll talk. the same document. Yeah, you and I don't, I just brought all my stuff from that night, but if you can give me those copies, if they do. All the only ones I have, but I'll oh, the only ones have, okay. After, okay. Yeah, I think I actually, I did get yeah. copies that night, so I have them in my pile, and we will talk about it when we get to, because um, there's some other things we're going to be doing over and above to help the people know Great. what they need to do, and who to call and how to handle this because it so is an issue. And so we will talk about that. And then the one other thing over and above is once we pass it here in New Paltz, we'll be making history, you know, second in the state of New York to pass this resolution. It'd be great to, if you could reach out to your colleagues in the towns up and down the Hudson Valley and from Albany South. Well, to, I will tell you that um, yesterday at the town supervisor's meeting, which is the town supervisor's Ulster County, it was discussed yesterday all the supervisors are asked, um, even if your town does not have the pipeline coming through, there's resolutions for the towns to pass to support all the towns. And I suspect because it was just done yesterday and we don't pass things you know, at a meeting where we just got it, at um, the next meeting of the supervisors, which is a Christmas lunch, but I suspect that there'll be a chance that the Supervisor Association will pass something. But we'll talk about that when we also okay. have a discussion. Great, because right. we, we got to stop. Yeah. And there's a lot of power in this yeah. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Very, very quickly, I'm Eugene Hammond, I'm in Plattic Hill. We were approached by Pilgrim Pipeline to run a side line going across our property, basically under the central, central Hudson lines to Roseton. Um, so my wife called Manager Joe Green of Clearwater, who said, who gave a couple of names to people to speak with and said, yeah, talk with them. So we talked with them and we refused them entry onto our property to do any survey or anything. Uh, just like drilled for oil is running out, shale oil and tar sand oil will run out as well. There are only a certain number of dinosaurs that died. Um, so in 30, 40 years, some people will make trillions of dollars off this, but the destruction of the water, we have 
well water, um, destruction of agriculture, and all the climate change from burning more fossil fuels will increase enormously and we will have a very harsh world left for our children and grandchildren here and the rest of the world. Um, and just one other thing, you know, most cities are built on, on the seashore. That's where shipping was. I mean, we had an example of Hurricane Sandy, which did tons of damage in New York and New Jersey and Long Island. It's, the first, it's one. It's going to continue happening. Um, we should not put money into doing more of this stuff. We should push for money for renewables, period. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would? Hi, my name is Joe Morito. I'd like to agree with this gentleman here. You know, I didn't need a surgeon general to tell me that, you know, cigarette smoking was bad for your health. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I didn't need a rocket scientist to tell me, you know, what goes up comes down. <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, when coal miners, you know, they, they had to wear these masks, black lung. You know, you spill gasoline, you spill petroleum, you know, it kills plants, it kills animals. You know, so I, I would think it's going to kill us, you know, and, and just like he said, you know, dirty air, dirty water, you know, uh, dirty air, dirty water, you know, dirty lies and dirty money. We've been getting it for de decades, you know, and uh, I'm totally against this fossil fuel. It's not, you know, New Paul's isn't going to see any money. Ulster County is not going to see any money. And, uh, <clears throat> and all this petroleum is going to go overseas. You know, it's not going to make us energy independent. And uh, I love Ulster County. I love the town board here for being progressive. You know, and uh, thank you. Thank okay. you. Um, because we have people who have come for the resolution, would it be no, we're going to do, it. We're, to do that before the budget? I had intended to do that, but there's still people. I'm not sure if anybody else oh, still wants to talk. Is there anybody else that um, intended or would like to talk? Okay, so then we're done with public comment. Now that was what we were going to do next. I just want to see if we finish with public comment. Okay, so um, let me just give a qu couple of, um, quick backgrounds and then um, I'll read the resolution. Uh, just so people do know, because some people do believe that you should always give the other side a chance to talk and do presentations uh, before you take action. And so I just want to point out that the town of Rosendale, which is really in harm's way, uh, has invited the industry to come speak to them for two, two months already. And they were supposed to come two months. They canceled both times. They're supposed to come in December. The Rosendale Town Board and Supervisor don't really believe that they're going to show up. But it's been about two and a half months that they've been offered to come and they haven't done it. So the Rosendale Town Board chose not to wait anymore and to act. And why it's really important that we act tonight and we do this sooner than later is they have not yet put their applications into the state at this moment to start this process. So the more organized we are and the more towns in Ulster County and throughout the state start to pass resolutions against it before they even put their proposal on the table, the better it is for us as the people who are trying to stop it. And usually we're always being reactive to all of these problems and projects, but we're really actually being very proactive. Um, because of all the work that was done through the fracking people all over the state, a network was created of people you know, fighting fracking all over the state. They are organized, they are together. You've got elected officials throughout the state of New York who have banded together and have been taking action. And so there is a network, there's a pipeline of elected officials and people against this project throughout the state. And they've organized and they are doing a great job and so the more the municipal governments can start to take a stand and be in the front of this, the better of a chance we'll have in terms of stopping this. And so that's why it's important to do it now and not wait. And that's why yesterday at the supervisors meeting, Manajo did come. She spoke to all the supervisors and um, most of them, even the ones who are, have a town that's not in the whatever, probably will pass resolutions to support the other towns and all of us you know, in Ulster County in the state. So. Um, it's, it is incredibly dangerous and um, they keep taking from us and they don't give back and there's absolutely no benefit to us, there's only harm. So what I will do is I will read the resolution 
Um, resolution opposing the Pilgrim Pipeline. Whereas the Pilgrim Pipeline Company is proposing to build a bi-directional pipeline through the town of New Paltz that would transport crude oil and refined petroleum products between Albany, New York, and Linden, New Jersey. And whereas the pipeline will carry oil from the back and shell region of North Dakota, extracted through a process of hydraulic fracturing or fracking, which has been found to contain contamin found to contaminate clean water resources, create toxic air emissions and radioactive waste and release large quantities of methane gas into the atmosphere, and whereas data collected by the Cape Line Pipeline in Louisiana, which tested for crude from 86 locations worldwide, indicates that crude oil from back and shale has far higher vapor pressure than crude from dozens of other locations, making it much more likely to throw off combustible gases, and whereas the U.S. Department of Transportation's pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration issued a safety alert on January 2, 2014 to the general public, emergency first responders and shippers and carriers regarding this particular flammability of backing crude oil, and whereas the pipeline will carry a large volume of backing crude oil through residential areas in the town of New Paltz, which in the opinion of the town board will place residents in harm's way should an explosion or spill occur, whereas according to the PHMSA, which is the, pipe, the, the Trans Department of Transportation's pipeline and it has this Material Safety Administration. Oper um, whereas, according to the PHMSA, pipeline operators reported 1,880 crude oil spills nationwide between 203 and 213, or nearly one spill every other day, resulting in 44,265,438 gallons of oil being spilled. And whereas 80% of these spills were a result of corrosion, equipment failure, incorrect operation, or material and weld failures. And whereas, according to the Public Employees of Environmental Responsibility, the PHMSA only has 135 inspectors to oversee 2.6 million of pipeline, and only a fifth of that pipeline system has been inspected by the PHMSA or its state partner since 2006. And whereas any rupture or compromise of the pipeline, even without an explosion or fire, could, in the opinion of the town board, require extraordinary cleanup efforts, force residents from their homes, and place a large number of residents in close proximity to hazardous materials. And whereas most New Pulse residents depend on groundwater and public community water systems for potable water supplies, the integrity and safety of which may, in the opinion of the town board, be jeopardized by the pipeline. And whereas the Pilgrim Pipeline is proposed to be laid in areas containing aquifers particularly sensitive to contamination, including a karst aquifer, unconfined sand aquifer, and alluvial aquifer upon which residents depend on for drinking water, and whereas the town of New Paltz has a ban on hydrofracking, and whereas in the opinion of the town board, we find the proposed Pilgrim Pipeline potentially threatens the health, safety, and welfare of the community, could decrease the values of homes located along its route and in surrounding neighborhoods, and could negatively impact future development in town, and whereas the Mid-Hudson Region Sustainability <coughs> Plan calls for becoming less energy and fossil fuel intensive while strengthening the regional economy, expanding renewable energy generation experientially across the region and improving the resilience of the energy delivery system. And whereas the construction of the Pilgrim Pipeline to support and expand markets for fossil fuel is directly contrary to these clean energy goals, now therefore be it resolved that the town of New Paltz, one, the town of New Paltz has a ban on fracking, Two, calls upon the New York State Thruway Authority to reject the use of its right of way for the purpose of transporting oil or gas by pipeline, and any further calls upon the New York State Department of Transportation to deny an exception to its accommodation plan for said purposes, and three, urges Governor Cuomo and the state legislature to oppose construction of the Pilgrim Pipeline in New York State, and four, directs the town clerk to forward copies of this resolution to the New York State Thruway Authority, Chair Howard P. Milstein, the New York State DOT Commissioner Joan McDonald, U.S. PHMSA Administrator Cynthia Quarterman, U.S. Senator Charles Schumer, Christine Gillibrand, who both just voted against the Keystone Pipeline, Representative Chris Gibson, Governor Andrew Cuomo, New York Member Assembly Kevin Cahill, New York Senator John Banasek, and the New York State DEC Commissioner Joe Martin. So, so I would like to ask for a motion to move it. So moved. I'd like to ask for a second. Second. Would anybody like to discuss? Uh, very quickly, because I don't want to be redundant because we've gone over this a lot. One other major component that hasn't been discussed is the effect of local emergency services if something were to happen. That's the number one thing that hasn't been talked about. And can you imagine, God forbid, our New Paltz Fire Department having to deal with fireballs off the highway in New Paltz? And that goes for anyone along the 150 mile stretch. 
And additionally, I just want to add to a, a thank you to uh, Rosendale Councilwoman Jen Metzger, who's also done a lot with this issue too. Okay, okay thanks. So um, I'm going to say some things afterwards, but first let's vote on it. All in favor? Can I just add one? Please? Sure, please, Kev. Uh, where it says, in the opinion of the town board, we find that the proposed Pilgrim Pipeline potentially threatens. I think we should add a little provision. Okay, can, wait, can you just tell me where, uh, which page and which paragraph? Page, uh, you're about the, uh, the fourth whereas? Or which fifth, 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 which fifth, which is, um, I would just fifth. add to that. Kevin, I just want to know where you are. Is it the fifth yeah, whereas it's, or the? Well, it's one, yeah, this two, one where three, three, four, five, five from the top. Okay. Under the section. Okay, where is the back of the page? Yeah, flip the page right over. Here. There you go. Flip the page oh. over, and then whereas in okay. the opinion. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, I would just add after the it's, it should read. I think in the opinion of the town board, there appears to be no direct benefits to the community, and we find. All right. Okay. I mean, there aren't any benefits at all to this community. It's only a detriment. So. That's the only change I have. Okay, to our community, and you want me to add, and it only seems to be, uh, you want me to add the negative also? Well, the negative is already there. Okay, okay, fine. Okay, so with that amendment, um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, motion so carried. The one thing that I just also want to add for the public, and we'll try to get this to the press, although they were there on Monday night, and I stated this Monday night, what is happening is, that they are going over to people's houses. They're trying to do surveying and doing some other stuff. And they're basically telling people that they can take their land by eminent domain. And it's not true. They can't. And they're bullying people into trying to sign these documents. And there was somebody, interestingly enough, who was there at the meeting the other night. And she actually works for an attorney. And um, she signed something and then realized afterwards that she might have signed something that she shouldn't have and was asking how to rescind it, and she was told how to rescind it. So what we want people of New Paltz to know is that if anybody comes and approaches you, that one, you don't have to let them on your land. Two, don't let them tell you things, and if you're confused or whatever, and if you feel threatened, we will be telling our New Paltz police, anybody who gets a call, anybody who gets threatened, anybody who shows up at the door and they don't leave, to call the New Post Police, and we will be asking the New Post Police to respond to people's homes to help them protect themselves against this corporation that has more power than any one individual. So we just want the people of New Post to know that, and the police will be notified, and we're taking this very seriously. So I just wanted to add that. Is there anything else? Um, just a quick question. Do we know the route in which they are going? Is there yeah, a rationale there, to the homes? There's a yeah, map. Yeah. There's but but a map. I'm saying, okay, it's well, down to New York City. Right. My, my, my question was if it would be at all possible, if this is not too costly endeavor, to mail a letter to the people within the town along that route. It might be possible. I do know, not only are they also looking to build the pipeline, what's really scary too is they're looking to build a bunch of transformer stations all along the route. Okay. You know, and whatever, and there is all well, the compressor stations, compressor stations, and there is no information that anybody has been able to get at all whatsoever on the compressor station. Yeah. So we don't even know where they're going to locate that. Yeah, my so, thought is that if we can map some of this yeah. out and know where they are, it would yeah. be great. We can, if we as can a try town, to do that. We do know. Can I just say that is a great idea? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah, I would certainly be willing to help yeah. out yeah. with that. If okay, yeah. I mean, we, so. yeah, we do know right now it's a long throughway, and what they're doing. We got a phone call from somebody. Um, in my office that was very concerned that they got approached but their neighbors didn't get approached and they couldn't understand what was going on and we said probably they need to go off the right of way and you know and that's why they're coming to you and so we can you know if you can try to get to Jen yeah, I, I know that right now there's a lot of information they're trying to get they don't have but if there's anything we can get that's forthcoming or maybe we could just see sort of like who's well, you could just go ahead and I mean better to overdo it than mm -hmm. send a letter yeah. to everybody Mm. Yeah. Well, we want to sort of get a sense of how far yeah, we'll and how deep off the right of way, we so we can do that. And then we can send them a letter letting them know that if somebody approaches them. Okay. And that was one of the things we spoke about on Monday night that I had suggested from a perspective of how do we, you know, like they're doing trainings to teach people. Who's going to go if they don't even know this is happening? Yeah. You know, and so they are doing a training in New Jersey. And one of the things is we're looking to see if there's a way to get a training here in Ulster County so residents would know and that we could probably identify and notify people up and down the throughway area to come to a training of how to understand how to handle this. 
And so that's again, it's like, you don't want to be, you know, like the poor person who already signed, like they're being told, well, you got to call the Department of State, you got to do that. That's not fair for some individual who doesn't know what they're doing to have to try now to undo a mistake because they were lied to. So we're trying to, you know, be very proactive in terms of getting on top of this. So great. we'll keep working and on I'll it. And I'll reach out to Jenna. Okay, great. So with that, I guess we will move on to, before we do the budget, let me do a just quick update on the town hall. As everybody knows, um, we have been in the midst of moving. We have our new temporary town hall, 6,000 square feet of modular space up on Clearwater Road. We are now neighbors of the highway department and the recycling center, and the RA transfer station is right across the road from us. <laughs> and um, so that's where we will be located going forward. Um, Please it's, also not forget you're also neighbors with some beautiful ball fields. From the ball fields, the right. BMX, uh, that's track, true, that's so. true. And actually, we're going to be starting a town baseball team for town employees because we're going to be going out during lunch and playing baseball. So, Jeff, uh, we'll mean, make them on Thursdays or Fridays when you're yeah, around. You're in, right? Former town board members have to it. play kitty. <laughs> town employees have to pay. But um, so we will be up on that road. It's been a very, very big undertaking. The town hall staff have been absolutely amazing. They've been in very compromised conditions, working on limited schedules, but still trying to do the work, having to pack up. Just imagine packing up your own home. Now try to picture packing up a government. We um, had some glitches along the way. Central Hudson has been absolutely amazing. Um, Chris and Stacy, this could never have gotten done without the help of Chris and Stacy. What these two have done has been beyond, beyond. Beyond. I mean, Stacy was so tired last night she couldn't even cut her food for dinner. That's how exhausted she was, and it's true. Um, so it's been amazing. <coughs> Everything's packed up. Everything's being moved. They've already moved the assessor's office. They've moved the building inspector's office. They moved most of the town clerk today. They'll be finishing up the town clerk, and then they have to do the supervisor payroll, uh, supervisor payroll, and bookkeeper. And so hopefully that'll happen tomorrow, and most of it'll be done by Friday. So it's been quite an undertaking, but the one thing you will notice when you walk into this new building is you actually have air to breathe because the past town hall had no air circulation, which was a part of the big problem of why it was a sick building because there was no airflow near air, 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 air circulation. And you don't realize it when you're in a building all the time, but when you walk into this new building, even though it's just temporary trailers, you walk in, you realize, oh my God, I can breathe. You actually realize there's fresh air. It's really quite remarkable. And um, so we are going to close Town Hall next week also. We're not going to be open to the public. All the employees are going to be asked to come to work so they can start unpacking their offices because we haven't let anybody be near the packing and unpacking to facilitate the move. So we're going to be asking everybody to come in next week. They have massive unpacking because every file was taken out, was cleaned with the HEPA vacuum and stuff. So everything's in boxes. So we need for everybody to come in Monday, start to put their offices together. And then what we will do is, because it's Thanksgiving and it's a short week, the following Monday, as of now, what we plan, and I did talk to Stacy and cleared this with her, Chris, is that what we will try to do is a co coordinate a ribbon cutting Monday morning around nine o'clock after Thanksgiving at the new town hall for everybody to come and uh, join us and see the new facility. And so that is the plan for now. What time do you have to be at work on Monday? I can make it. Okay, so we'll try to do it like around nine o'clock because I know a lot of the employees come back. Maybe we'll do it about 10 or something. We'll figure it out. We'll do Let something and we'll work on it. We just figured it out today when we were trying to assess everything. So um, that's the update on that. It's been quite an undertaking. So with that, I don't think I have, there's nothing else to add, Chris, is there? Uh, you want to talk about the stuff we found? Oh, yes. So actually, as they were moving everything today and yesterday, what did they discover? More mold. <laughs> so Chris came back today and said, well, I found some more reservoirs where the mold was. So as they've been moving things out, things have been exposed and more mold and toxins have been showing in the building. So um, Chris is uh, seeing that every day. So there's more problems than we thought, but we're out of there. So that's that. So with that. Is and the other good news is, as everyone knows, we are using a professional really, uh, right. company to remediate all the products. I know Chris has been working very close with them and everyone is taking all the precautions so none of our employees are being exposed to anything hazardous and this is what the company did is that we signed the contract with. So we're making sure everyone is safe. Right, right. So 
Okay, and so with that, we'll go to the town budget. Let me just pass out to everybody the uh, Quite a what? Quite a diverse topic. <laughs> yeah, really, seriously. Okay, so, so here is the cover sheet. I don't think so. What? Uh, do you want to know if we have any uh, transfers? I don't think we're doing any transfers. Do we do any? Uh, I think doing, next month we'll be We're not doing any no. transfers, no. I think Arlene, Arlene should. She couldn't, she couldn't. She uh, couldn't put them together, and I think we will yeah. have some. Uh, no, she did whatever transfers. She did whatever. Whatever we did last week was as much as she could do, because then the system got shut down. So, um, so now here, let me give here's um, guys here. It's just, now it has every column filled in. Okay. Here, Rosanna. <laughs> okay. Um, then. Okay, here's the revenue, okay. The new revenue. The new revenue. Filled in. Okay. Rosanna? Okay. Okay, so everybody's got that. So basically, in essence, the only thing that's really changed from all the meetings that we've had in conversations is really the allocation of the fund balance and um, the amount to be raised in taxes. So as you know, I, uh, under the uh, tax cap, the, all the calculations, what you do is you fill everything, you fill in the fields that they ask for, and then they tell you what you need to, um, what your tax levy needs to be to stay under the cap. And the tax levy, according to um, the state controller, to stay under the cap, it needs to be seven million seven hundred forty thousand two hundred forty-seven dollars. Seven, what was chosen? This, this oh, number. <laughs> it's, 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 uh, did you get you didn't get the cover sheet? Well, you gave it to Rosanna. She has one. I gave you two. Well, that would make mine on that one. Right. Thank you. Well, I'll give you actually, yeah, okay. She'll need a second set of everything, actually, so I'll give you a second set, okay? So that's the number. So what we did was, and I went through this with the um, outside auditor. We took, um, we had $45,000 we were gonna use in fund balance for DB, we took that out. We had 55,000 we were gonna use in DA, we took that out. We reduced the B fund, which was gonna be 349,668 down to 298,000. And I felt more comfortable about that number and I still, this is about the only line that's giving me be agita, but we'll talk about that in a second. And for the A fund, um, we took that down from $976,558 down to 852,040 and then reduce the amount to be raised by taxes to um, balance everything out which still leaves us under the cap and um, makes us you know okay with the fund balance in terms of where we're at with the fund balance and we talked about this in terms of depending so much on the fund balance but people are really hurting taxes are really high and there has to be some, what's the word I'm trying to think of, um, changes, what's, not strategic changes, but um, not fundamental. What's the word, Kevin, I'm looking for? Where you sort of change, like the structure of something and you have to make. Operational efficiency? Yeah, there's some, well, there's some operational. Structural changes? Struct structural changes, that's the word. Structural changes are gonna have to be made going forward because you can't balance a budget on fund balance. We basically are though, for all intents and purposes, next year, if we had to use fund balances to the same level we're doing this year, we still have enough money in all of the fund balances to do it and still have like 10 to 15% left of the fund balance, which is a very healthy fund balance. So I feel comfortable. I also believe we're gonna be putting in some money back into the fund balance. I went with Arlene on Saturday sitting in a sick room, one of the worst room of all rooms because we had to try to get onto the admin system because everything was shut down. Um, to look at where we're at this year in terms of revenue and expenses, we're very good on revenues, we're pretty good on expenses, so we should be okay even putting more money back into the fund balance against year. next year. Where I have a little bit of concern is unfortunately the town outside the village, which is the B fund, um, we're down to 298,000. Um, that will keep 600,000 in there. Um, no, 298, I'm sorry, that will um, put the 251 back up by about another 100, so it'll be 351,000. 
but we're using 298 to balance the budget. So it'll still leave about 100,000 in there if we needed that money next year, which is still between 15 and 20%. So maybe we'll be okay. And plus, we have 75,000 in there this year for the possible <coughs> joint, town master, joint town village master plan. So 75,000 will come out of next year's budget. So that will reduce the pressure on the fund balance. So all in all, I think we really will be okay. But I still do believe we're going to have to start to make some structural changes between the services we provide and the balance between the town and the village and how we pay for everything out of the A fund and the expenses incurred. And then, of course, we as a board want to start looking at the structural changes in terms of how we deal with all the property off the tax rolls and the services we provide to the college. Um, you know, so those are things we're going to have to thin. We still have to make a decision. We have 350000 in the fund balance. This year we had 400,000. We put 100,000 away for the potential if we had to move out of a building, because we always sort of thought that might be not potential on the day came. Not the fund balance. You're I'm sorry, contingency, 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 right. So we had, had 400,000. That contingency was high last year, a little bit high, but part of it was in case we had to move, and that's why you have contingency, because look what happened. We had to move, but we had the money to do it, and so it didn't put pressure on the taxpayers at all. Um, we have that, we had money to potentially settle the police contract, which we still have to do. Um, and then we put money in there in case we were gonna to try to bring in like, you know, you know, beef up the budget department. And um, we didn't do that, but we do have it in this budget, so it's, you know, it's a part of the budget. So we still have 350,000 in the fund balance. Um, that will, in contingency, I'm sorry, in contingency. So we need some money for the police contract when we finally do settle that. Um, we still have to answer the question of the 25000 for the rescue squad. So there is money. I did not put more money in or take money out of the fund balance or anything out of that 350. 25 can be allocated to the rescue squad. I know that they probably need to know by January 1st for their next year's budget. So I don't know if the board wants to take action tonight. The money's there in the fund balance. If you want to move it into the rescue squad line, the 25 grand, we can make the change before um, Rosetta takes it up to the controller. Or we can always make a, um, we can always do a um, transfer, you know, we can always do a, a budget modification early next year. So we just, that's something we still have to address and I don't know how the board wants to address it or what they want to do. I think we kind of addressed, or I believe we addressed it by saying we would have it in our fund balance and that we would have it in, in, our, our, uh, in our contingency. And since it will be in contingency, we can allocate it if it turns out it is needed. Based on our discretion. Based on discretion and based on if the funds are needed. Uh, I don't think we've even come close to answering that question if the funds are truly needed. Okay, so what so I would like to do I, though is... I would is rather it? just leave it in the... I, I'd rather leave it in contingency because okay. we do have the funds in contingency. I think that if I recall the conversation, we did commit to them that we would revisit it at another date. Um, based on the needs, so I think that's appropriate to keep it up for now. The only thing I would like to do, and I don't have a problem doing that, um, but what I'd like to do is have a commitment from this board yeah. that we will work with the rescue squad to get to a point where there's a comfort level so we can make a decision and not just leave it hanging. Oh, so, absolutely. So, so I just need oh, you know, no, commitment I, I do from think that they left that meeting with the understanding that they were going to get the extra money, but that we were not going to place it in the, mu in the budget as of right now. Right, and that the extra money would have it turned out that there was a need for it. And we need, because we both left with, uh, I believe they left with prepared with more questions. I believe Ted and their budget left with more questions. Uh, you know, I, I gave them the information that, you know, they were using information based off of their budget. Uh, you know, they need to answer still some of the questions, about, you know, their budget, for example, uh, showing that they were going to bring in uh, 700 and some thousand dollars in revenue when you know they haven't brought in 700 and th some thousand dollars in revenue in over five or six years. They, last year they brought in 950 thousand dollars in revenue. The year before they brought in 820 thousand dollars in revenue. So I, I think there's some there, there's some budgeting issues that I think need to be addressed in the shortfalls. I mean they're showing a loss of. $210,000 and, and the data they provided to us didn't support that, okay. so. Well, I, I don't want to get into a whole conversation no, I don't want about you, yeah. just I just want to make sure that, I mean, I just want to make, I, right, so I just want to be very clear that out of the 350, of which I definitely know that we're going to have to take money for the settlement <coughs> of the police contract, hopefully we'll settle the contract. No, we will be uh, Hopefully we'll be yeah, settling we'll a police contract. Yeah. 
that um, <coughs> that uh, um, we have 350. We you know and uh, so that the 25,000 is there if we need it. And yes. That still leaves us 320, yeah, 325 to settle the contract, which then will still leave us money in a fund balance in a contingency for emergencies, which you need to have. Um, without getting into a long discussion about the budget situation, because the board is pretty clear where they feel that it was brought up during public comments, so I will just address one comment is that the, the supervisor is the CFO, and the supervisor will always be the CFO, and the supervisor is responsible to the public, and the public can vote them in or vote them out if they should choose to run again. And so um, the public still has an elected CFO. The purpose of why this board felt really strongly about bringing in a fiscal officer per se, you know, uh, you know, in terms of that is because it's a continuation of when a supervisor leaves and another supervisor comes in, there is nobody there who's particularly really understands the bigger picture. A bookkeeper just keeps the books. They don't understand the overall finances, the grants that have to be followed up on. I mean, again, when I came in, there was $250,000 of grant money, of FEMA money, that had not been collected or touched. And we're still, the money that you, that um, when Jeff and Kitty were on the board for the comprehensive master plan that you did not adopt, that you did from the Hudson Valley Greenway, from I don't know how many years ago, that money still has not been collected. And even though we got on top of doing the paperwork, what ended up happening was when we got all the paperwork reconstituted last year, the bookkeeper, unfortunately because of other issues, other problems, it never got filed. And it wasn't until recently when we were trying to close out some other grants you know, that we found out that that still hadn't been filed, so now we have to do it again and get it filed again. That should not happen. Just because I'm on top of it doesn't mean the next person's going to be on top of it. If you have a fiscal person there all the time that's not a bookkeeper but a bigger person overseeing everything, it doesn't matter who the supervisor is. There's somebody there with the continuum to keep the town in the shape it needs to be. And unfortunately, you can't always count on the board either, as evidenced by the controller's report, that sometimes there isn't oversight on the supervisor because board members are part-time board people who also have a lot to do. And again, you can also get a supervisor who unfortunately can't add two plus two, but they were the person that the Democrats nominated or the Republicans nominated, and that was your choice. And you can find yourself in a fiscal mess that we found ourselves in. So this board has been talking about this for a while, and we believe after going through these past three annual reports, where even though we've been on top of everything and doing everything, so last year when we sort of thought we could get the annual report done, this year in time, it ended up still being six months late because the digging to find where money was placed because the bookkeeper was so overloaded that they would just park money here and then forget to move it down the road. The time spent to dig out where that money was was so cumbersome and so hard that the annual report was still done really late and we're still trying to rectify problems. So to have somebody consistent who is not elected and then leaves and not elected and whatever, you need somebody to manage the finances. It's the most important thing of this town and the budget's gotten more cumbersome. It um, has more, it can, you know, more things you have to file with the state and stuff that you have to do. And so I believe and I think this board still agrees and if anybody disagrees they can say that it's the most responsible thing that we can do is actually to put this person in place and have somebody who's here consistently year after year after year who understands the finances, watch outs for the town's finances, and um, throw out your, your CFO, elect your CFO again, but you know, at the end of the day, you can't depend on your CFO as an elected official to do what's right for the town when it comes to finances. And so, if anybody on the board feels differently. I, I have a, a clarifying sure, question just about sure. the position because we've gone back and forth with this. Um, so my understanding of this role is that this will be an item that will be civil service. Correct. Yes, because we don't want this position to be political and we don't want this position to be, to bring somebody in in this position yeah. that the supervisor or the board can appoint yeah. is not serving what we want to do, which is taking somebody outside of politics mm -hmm. to be responsible for finances and um, that's why we wanted civil service. So we have taken the um, finance director um, thing we worked out, we yep. worked on and all the 
qualifications. Mm -hmm. I've sent it up to civil service to Sherry Cross, who's now the chair, who's now in charge of it, and asked her to start to do what needs to be done in order to make it a civil service position. Chances are, what will happen is we'll interview people and hire somebody before the test is created, so the person would be hired provisionally, and then when civil service creates the test, the person would have to be take the test, and then they would be appointed through civil service and have the protection. So it's we're trying to make this position outside of politics. But that, so then the board will hire someone, yes, and then they will subsequently go back and take the civil service exam, and then again just. My understanding is that, because we do have a local law in the books, that we would, could potentially hire local first. Well, we have to, uh, we uh, we, okay. it has to be local first. If yep. we have somebody, if we have people who apply who are um, local, they, they get first choice. Okay. Hence Arlene. Okay. <laughs> and a lot of other people. But mm -hmm. Arlene, when we interviewed, we had some really, really competent people that were applying for the job, but the people who were um, New Post residents got looked at more seriously and <coughs> we, had some, we had some qualified people from New Pools. That's who we hired. So my only question is, is there a way for us to allow for the civil service exam to happen prior to us hiring? No, absolutely not because it takes, um, um, it takes them a long time to create the test and schedule the test. So a lot of people we have, we hire, we hire provisionally and then they have to take the test and if they don't pass the test, then they lose the job. So there's some people we have like right now, like Arlene. Um, she she hadn't she hasn't taken the test. There were no bookkeepers on the list when we were looking for bookkeepers or something. I don't think there were bookkeepers on the civil service list. I can't remember. And um, but so she was provisional. She's got to take the test. Rachel, who's the bookkeeper's assistant, she's provisional. I think she's scheduled in like two weeks to take the test or something. Mm -hmm. So what happens is sometimes there's a nobody on the list. So you hire somebody provisionally, then they have to take the test or you create a position, then civil service has to create mm -hmm. that test, and then they put the test out for anybody to take, and that could be a year, two, three, before they create that. Okay, so it would, you're talking about the potential of it taking yeah. that one. Yeah. It was three years I had to take one. It was three years after the okay. hire. What yeah. I was thinking yeah. potential was, I thought this would be done within a year, no. is the idea of having putting out the yeah. test, so then in between that time, we'll save on that money, hire someone off the test, but it's going to take two or three no, years. That the, really the, 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 it's not a matter of saving the money. If we needed to save the money, we wouldn't have created the position. Mm -hmm. Okay, So we're not looking to save money. Well, let me, let me frame it to you the other way. My belief, and I think some of the board members sitting to my left believe that by creating this position, you'll, you'll we're going to save so much more yep. money that it's going to pay for itself because you're going to finally have somebody watching over things. You're never going to have grants that don't get, you know, I mean, again, I came in. I remember it was my the first meeting I was at was the Town Village um, Joint Comprehensive Plan um, Joint um, not Comprehensive Plan it was the um, consolidation it was the consolidation um, so the Joint Town Village had a first meeting on consolidation Jerry Benjamin had asked us to pass a um, resolution asking for Home Rule to allow us to you know have coterminous town villages qualify for the million dollars. Mm -hmm. okay, at the end of that meeting, this is my first meeting that I had coming back you know, to this job, the, head, the guy from the Department of State came over to me and said, do you know that you have a $50,000 reimbursable grant that you guys have not applied for? Mm -hmm. So I turned to um, Peter Fairweather, who was the consult consultant that was hired, and I said, Peter, what's he talking about? I don't know. And he said, we put in all the paperwork, it was all done, I don't know what happened. Okay? Mm -hmm. So what happened was we had to go back and recreate all of that paperwork so we can get that $50,000. Then we found out about another grant, I can't remember what it was, that we hadn't gotten. Then, this was amazing, um, um, Frank Ludico had come down to get me to sign something for Urgent. Mm -hmm. and he started to tell me a story about how the FEMA people were using the, um, um, the jail space to basically do FEMA, and he was telling me something about the federal government. So I happened to say, can you do me a favor? I said, I'm you know, brand new. I don't know, if, you know what I have to do. Can you just check with the FEMA people? Is there anything I need to do as a new supervisor? He came back and said, Susan, they said the town didn't put anything in, okay? But because your highway superintendent went to the FEMA meeting and filled out paperwork, that because of that, we could apply for the FEMA money we were owed, mm -hmm. which was the tune of over $75,000, I can't even remember. It might have been more. This was 75 or was it even more? It was like it ended up being more than that. Okay, so it ended up being close to 100000 if not more, of money that had never been sought after, okay? But because the highway superintendent had filed the paperwork, they let us 
recreate all the paperwork, which we did, we got everybody back in, recreated everything, and then we put it into the highway department. I couldn't sign off of everything, Carol West signed off on everything, because she was the authorizing name, not the supervisor. That was $100,000. So then I go to my very first, um, not CWAS, maybe it was the NCB, Seth McKee's on ENCB? He's on okay. CWAS. Oh, this was, was then, no. He was, I, he was on ENCB, uh, but maybe it was, yeah, maybe it was CWAS, but I don't remember which meeting it was. I, I'm already now in office for two months, a month and a half, two months. I go to the first CWAS meeting. At the very end of the meeting, Seth McKee goes to me, Susan, I didn't really want to bother you. He goes, but there's this grant money for this grant that we did on um, Milbrook Preserve. Okay, he said that we, you know, that was never put through, never applied for, never whatever. But I didn't want to bother you the first month you were there. And I looked at Seth and I said, Seth, I said, you could come to me day one because now you're fifth in line. So that kind of stuff, if it wasn't for people saying to me, Susan, okay, I wouldn't have known. I would have had no clue to follow up on these grants. If I didn't happen to just by chance say something to Flutico for him to go ask the female people, I would have never known that we didn't do this to follow up. So that was $250,000 mm -hmm. of money that we've brought in in these past two and a half years that could have been lost to this town because one supervisor left, another supervisor came in, and there's no clue. And so if you had somebody who was there who was in charge of this kind of stuff, and you can't expect the bookkeeper. The bookkeeper's just putting the money where it needs to be in the right line so you know, you know for the controller's order sure. and stuff and whatever. And you need, I believe, and this so board believes can, that we can need. I just make one well, actually, we had public comments, so. <laughs> so. The, the other thing that I'm wondering, too, and, and you'd best be able to answer this <laughs> as, as the supervisor, I simply don't know. Do you consider this position then a position that relinquishes some of your own authority, or rather a position that's oversight for your authority and to aid with it? I absolutely do not think it relinquishes doing. my authority in the slightest. It actually will not make my life that much easier. I think it makes the bookkeeping, I, well, let me put it to you this way. I'm can, still the same problem. Can I answer that? I'm, go ahead. It solves five or six major problems that we've identified over the last three years. And a lot of it has to do with properly accounting for funds that come in through the town. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of departments that have the bookkeeping function uh, that they shouldn't have. It should be consolidated. So we really need this position to have a centralized kind of control over all of our accounting. And not only that, I want this person to be able to now go out and price out alternative services and goods that we purchase for the town. Nobody's out there trying to find a better deal for services that we pay for or for goods that we have to purchase and consume here as town employees. So this person's gonna have the ability not only to centralize the data management and accounting and properly account for things, like now we have escrows that are properly managed for, for projects. We, we have resolutions that we pass to properly fund them. All that wasn't done before. So now there's additional work that, that is going to be done to properly account for all that, and then there will be additional work for that person to go out and drive more efficiency forward. There's also, there's also um, with union contracts, there's a lot of things about the SIP time, like managing, you know, like the SIP time and a lot of the things through union contracts that the payroll person, you know, follows certain things. You know, she gets the report she's given and stuff, but who's really managing it and seeing that everything's being book kept right and that nobody's taking advantage of more time. And it's not the bookkeeper's job to do it, you know, but there's only so much work that can be done. And then if you also look at the bookkeeping department, it hasn't grown with the town. It's still staffed the way it was staffed when I was here 15 years ago, you know, except for maybe one extra person, one full part-time person. No, actually when I was here, there's only one person. Now there's one person and somebody who's helping with day-to-day -day operations. But the amount, I mean, the budget's doubled, okay? The amount of, and stuff that you have to do through the state is, you know, changed. So there's so much stuff that needs to be done. It doesn't change my fact that the supervisor is still the chief fiscal officer, mm -hmm. still responsible, you know, for the fiscal sanity of the town, responsible for doing the budget, responsible for managing the budget. It's just that, but the supervisor is also trying to do a lawsuit, with, you know, with Wilma Wright, trying to do a Pilgrim Pipeline trying to, you know, talk about, you know, so many other projects, do, you know, do bicycle paths, do other things. And so to do the things like Kevin's talking about, like go, like, like Jeff wants to see if we can do contract, uh, do um, contracting for the police uniforms um, to see if we can, you know, save money instead of them getting $300 so, 
you know, in their budget, you know, to just clean their uniforms, but they don't clean their uniforms, they wash them, we'll do a contract. Mm -hmm. You don't want me spending my time researching contracts for police uniforms. You want me spending my time making sure that we're on top of the lawsuit with the IDA, you know, that we're basically, you know, making sure we're gonna, you know, purchase, you know, open space right, that we're gonna, you know, you know the type of things that we deal with all the time, guys. Like deal with the town hall move, you know, not pricing out. I mean, honestly, if you were going to ask me to price out police contract, you know, police uniforms, I'd say thanks, bye. And, <laughs> and I think Dan also. I mean, it is kind of important. And yes, Kitty, you know, I don't do this easily. And I will take the example of uh, you know, Susan is being uh, better than obviously I am. Uh, Tony Hokanson completely destroyed our. Uh, budgets for years in this community. If anyone has a problem with that, please call me and I will take them. We'll sit down in Arlene's office. I mean, we went back to 2006, 2007 and just found absolutely unexcusable errors in budgeting. Very, I won't say simple, but should not have. A, and that's the problem if you get someone who does not understand budgets and how to do budgets. You know, Kitty, you and I sat there and did not vote for budgets because we knew they were a mess. But we, we, lost. we lost three to two. We had one budget that went unapproved for lack of a better term. We had to take the budget that the supervisor had handed down. And that budget was a mess. Susan had to inherit that budget. This board had to inherit that budget. And there were many, many errors in that that we're still paying for to this day. We have spent a tremendous it's amount nice. on outside help to was try to get this budget back. Uh, you know, I think to Dan's question, yeah, Dan, one of the things you can do under town law mm -hmm. is she can appoint a budget officer. She it doesn't relinquish her duties as CFO. What it relinquishes, though, is it does allow someone else to to do the budget. And, and Kitty, I hear what you're saying is wait a year. I, I'm sorry wait. to say <laughs> I've, <laughs> I've waited four I, I waited four years for this. I really think three or four years ago, I was ready to bring in a full-time professional. I will use the town clerk's office. You know, we had a town clerk in there, and I, and I won't look at Rosanna now or ask her for a comment on it, but we threw away, you know, we threw away 452 shoes. Just out of the, I just made that number up, but it was directionally close. You don't need to say, don't make me go get the pictures. I will get the pictures. Our clerk's office was a complete disaster. The records were a disaster. I couldn't go there and pull a contract on existing contracts in our town, which the clerk's office was, that is one of their specific duties, is keeping the town information safe and available. I can go there now, I can get a contract in minutes. I can get information in minutes. So you can say you're going to elect someone to an elected position, and if you don't like them, take them out. But it's a lot of these pieces that you don't see it. Unfortunately, like look at the attendance at our budget meeting. This is the attendance at it here. So, you know, we're very fortunate right now. We have a town clerk's office where I'm proud to have people go into that office. They're even I more proud of when they go to the new temporary but town But I <laughs> used to, and you used to be there too. We were embarrassed to go into the old clerk's office. You not, we used to not be able to go in and have a meeting in our supervisor's office because there were just piles of, I don't even know what it was, and you could just see that it was not being run properly, and you and I would sit there until one or two in the morning having actual fights with our supervisor because we knew it was wrong and couldn't be corrected, and it wasn't being corrected. So I don't know if, and it only takes about, it, it takes a couple of years for the budget inaccuracies to catch up to you. You don't see them right away. So I don't know if an elected official, I, I don't personally believe an elected official way is a way to do it. I do believe a person being hired by a sitting town board is the way to do it. And you bring in a bookkeeper, a, a fiscal person, you hire a fiscal person to actually do it. So I do hear what you're saying about waiting a year and see where we are. We definitely already waited one year because we did fund this in our budget last year and we didn't mm -hmm. do it. And I've been ready for several years to do it. I can't guarantee that the next person elected as supervisor of this community is going to be a, a competent bookkeeper, which is a huge part of it. And you know, Kevin says there are, you know, we'll use the example, we are getting some of these things done for best cost. I mean, you know, Kevin will sit here and tell you how often does he say, 
can you call them? And we do call them. I had called the computer company. When I got, I got another, you know, 75 points. I got a little, almost a percentage off of an interest rate on some computers we were getting. We've had our chief call and get better rates on different products they purchased. But if you have a budget person, this is all they do, and has even still will be a very small staff. They can then undertake all these, and you'll bring back in a lot more cost efficiency. The only thing but I, I do want to hear what you want to say, Kitty. I, I, I don't know. There's only one last thing I want to say is when I was supervisor the first time, I didn't need I never would have considered it. I wouldn't have thought of it. I didn't think we needed it. But coming back this time with the budget to the level that it is, you know, how much money we spend, how much we spend every day, how much, you know, you know, the amount of um, um, purchase orders that go through this town at this particular point in time is extraordinary. It's extraordinary. And you know, and the mess that was inherited, and what we walked into, and what we've seen, and all the problems that we're discovering, are so deep and so problematic that that's when I realized that we can no longer, as a town, function with the bookkeeping the way it is, and with a supervisor being the CFO, and that you just have to hope you get somebody good, and that we're beyond that point. And I just honestly believe that one of the best things that this board is doing for this community is to put this person in place so the day that this board walks out and the day I'm no longer supervisor, I can feel confident that the town is being taken care of, whether I'm here or not. And if the next person only cares about the environment, so be it. But I mean, honestly, Kitty, again, you know I don't like to spend money and you know how much I manage the budget and how well, you know, what I do and all this kinds of stuff. Since the day I walked in and started discovering the problems, that, and because I had the experience, okay? So it's not like I just walked in and said, oh my God, what I get into? I was here for four years. I know what I did the first four years, and I know what I had to deal with. What I've experienced these last three years, Kitty, I'm sorry, you can never let the town get in the shape again. That's it. You did warn me, and I did. I'm getting pretty clear sense okay. of where this is going. Um, but we should want to hear what you're saying. The problem for me is that everything you've just said about not wanting to leave the town in the hands of an incompetent supervisor could be just as true of the person that you appoint the civil service position. You won't know well, that. Absolutely not. Here. It, of course it's possible. Nope. You could find that you hire somebody who looks great on paper and the one person, Councilwoman Gallucci, who has had this job, who could have helped inform your deliberations on this, has not been at a single budget hearing. And so I give us her input on this. Wait, that means okay. you're not even speaking to somebody. Mm -hmm. So what I want to know is, are all of these uh, grant monies that are due in the budget now? You mean the revenue? Yes. The, 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 re the revenue is already being. If it came in, it's. Um, if it came in, it's in this year's revenue and, and or last year's revenue. And, but, but, <coughs> like last year, last year, anticipated revenue. No, 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 no. But because, what I'm saying is, that's how you know what hasn't been done. If you're expecting mm -hmm. FEMA money and you haven't gotten it yet, it should be in your anticipated revenue. No, because what ended up happening was. But when, I'm talking about this budget no. right now because that's how the. Yeah, so this budget has this, but this budget has whatever anticipated revenues so are expected. All, the, all of the budgets, the grants that you haven't gotten yet. This is the only one. The only one that we have not gotten at this moment from the past is the Hudson River Greenway grant for the. Which um, you probably won't get because you didn't adopt the plan. No, no, no. What we will do, we will do. We'll, we get it minus um, ten percent. Okay. Well, you know, we're, we're, we're okay. going to get it. We're going to get it minus, but I think, ten percent because we didn't adopt well, that's it. That's the continuity. Oh, no, it's no, in I, the budget. When you go to prepare mm -hmm. your budget a year from now, you say, you know what? We never got that grant. Mm -hmm. Who dropped the ball on that? And that's your continuity. The, who dropped the ball? The supervisor dropped the ball. If you have a finance person, they probably won't drop the ball because that's what they do. They're but booking the me that. Whole board will sit here and look at the budget. But that's the problem. We said that's why I'm going to start. But we're not talking about with all due respect. Kitty, books. you were on the board. Okay, and I adopted. Kitty, 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 I adopted you. I adopted you. Kitty, Kitty, I, Kitty, I, 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 I,
all the bookkeeping and the revenues of this, the that. But it's it, 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 what you just said, Kitty, okay? You guys were on the board. You had a grant for $50,000. It was never shown in the revenue that you know that you hadn't gotten it, and it was in the budget next year that I adopted. Actually, it was. That's why we kept asking for. Wait a minute. We but, want updated revenues. We keep mm -hmm. carrying this thing over, and we never got the money. Okay. All I'm saying is that if you if you hire this person in a civil suit, if you really feel that you need this person so desperately right now, then we need to hire an then. outside person who's not a civil service that you're not committed to for the rest of your budgetary lives. For one year, just put it in for a one year. Don't make it civil service. Don't make well, it full time well, employee. And see if a year from now I'm reversing myself. Try it for one year. Well, Don't make the commitment that this is going to be a full time benefited well, town position. Well, first, what I will just say, a just let me just say, unfortunately, Jean has been sick. She will be okay, but she has been on medical leave, so. She has been home. She's working from home. She's on medical leave. She has been, at, you know, I mean, it started by her being taken to the hospital by ambulance, like a day after one of our board meetings and stuff. And then she's been going through a lot of, well, actually, under HIPAA, I shouldn't even be talking about this. But she is on medical leave. Okay, so that's why she's not been here. We as a board, however, have been talking about this for the past three years. We even talked about it when you were here, and we didn't know, we know you didn't support it then. So you know we've been talking about it. And Jean has been supportive of this also all along. So it's Jean's opinion has been a part of the story. You know, she just has not been here for the budget process, and that's due to health. Um, in terms of the requirements, we sat here as a board and set requirements, and Jeff was pretty tough. I mean, in terms of the standard that Jeff set, you know, and I'm looking to see, I probably have it here, Kitty, so just give me 30 seconds and I'll find the sheet that we wrote. I mean, the person's got to have like, 10 years bookkeeping, um, book, book, you know, bookkeeping experience, five year municipal bookkeeping experience. They have to have certain degrees, certain, I mean, the qualifications are pretty high standard. And so, you know, and again, we're gonna bring the person, by the time it becomes a tested position, it'll be over. That's part of it, yes. That's inside of the two. That's in the job description. Yeah, I have it here. We need put in experience, not the contract, but the contracts, because We've spent days, you know, I have spent days working on simple, what you think would be simple math for our contracts. And I, I only have so much time, too, as you know. You know we only have so many days in a month that I, that I can give. No, I want to. My memory of the contracts was that if it was anything that hadn't been there in the past, there was no way you were going to get it down. So contracts, unfortunately, have become much more complex, and Bill Wallens uh, has educated me heavily on them. Uh, believe it or not, anything you propose or they propose or that's even in the contract, you now need to fill it in with what is the economic impact of this. And it's even as simple as uh, there was a request for, I don't want to know. There have been some requests made by the union side. And for them to then fulfill these, the requests they have made, we need to give the economic impacts of it. Health benefits being a big one. Contributing to health benefits, as you know, our police department to this day, uh, we do have our uh, lieutenant, his contract does contribute to health benefits now. Uh, so we do have a leadership of our police. We are now going to our uh, police unit, it's, you know, the bargaining unit, asking them to please contribute to benefits because all public service workers are now contributing to health benefits. But we now need to give the economic backup to it, and it's a lot of work, a tremendous amount of work. So that was what we would say. I do not want, no, we're not hiring a position for someone to come in and negotiate contracts for no, us, but they will job. come in and assist us in doing the background math. Because right now, it's myself and Susan, and we're trying to use our own part of it, but her time is being very heavily used on the budget right now, and getting our budget <laughs> in place. And that, that's full time right there. Well, I, 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 I hear you loud and clear, though, Katie. Right thing, but I think you are um, committing the town to a long-term expense that you will regret. And we will be the only town in Ulster County with a person in this position. But there's other they, other towns have other different, like Ulster has had a budget officer, and other towns. One, and actually I asked um, our yeah. Ulster County controller if there was any other town in Ulster County with a position like this, and there is not. 
Most of them, Dutchess County, have it. Tell, tell, tell. We're pretty no, no. big for Ulster County. Tell, 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 tell what the, uh, in the, the town that has, uh, the person lives in Newport, so part-time control. Town of Hyde Park actually has um, a 1099 controller that gets paid $63,000 a year. Part-time. Part-time for 1,200 hours of work and two full-time assistants. You might try that for a year before you can get, once you have a civil service job, if you're not happy with the quality of the work, you know what that path looks like. Yeah. Try, try the high park solution. Well, I don't want to take too many lessons from my, I don't want to take too many lessons from my park, maybe in the wetlands law. What, what I wanted to say very quickly, I, be careful about I do have Kitty and I can get it to you. I thought I did have the copy here, but I'm surprised I can't find it. Um, because if you see the qualifications that we've established for this position, it's pretty damn high. And um, the qualifications and what they need to know and what their background is, and what they're being asked to. So, okay. Okay. We, did wrong was qualified. we did a great job, Ben, didn't we? <laughs> That's all I'm saying. Um, don't need to get what you want. What, what is the, assuming we go forward with this, what is the timetable for putting someone in this position? Well, hopefully we'll be advertising shortly and trying to start interviewing people. So is there a date when we would potentially want someone to start, Mr. Cole? I think it would be nice to have somebody start at the beginning of the year. So we just honestly, truth be told, we actually approved this position the very first budget meeting we had back in September. So if we didn't have a town hall move that has consumed the last two months of my life, um, we'd probably, I probably would have had it uh, advertised and we would have been interviewing and we probably would have already hired somebody. But unfortunately, I just, there's only so much I can do in a given day and this move has, you know, in addition to taking so, care of everything else, has consumed me. So I just so haven't had the time to. Susan? Yeah, wanna? Katie, are you finished? Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Okay. Let's, let's so would you like, uh, so I'd like to have, um, um, somebody um, move the 2015 town budget. So moved. Okay. No, Could have a second. Second. I'm sick though, but that's okay. Just a, a, Any discussion? Just, just a little discussion piece. Sure. So the, the numbers that we have today will result in a tax increase. Of, yeah, sure. Uh, whatever it is, it's under the cap. Uh, okay, but <laughs> it is. It, it, It'll be like, it's a, short, it's a small tax increase. Yes. What is that exact percentage? You know, I don't know exactly. Is it one, one, one and a half percent? I think percent? it's like 1.2 or something. Like it's, 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 it's a really interesting, it's a really interesting, strange dynamic. The okay, way uh, it shows you the percent increase, but you're still under the cap. So. Thank you, Kitty. Thank you all. See, thank, thank you. Thanks, thanks Kitty. Thanks, Kitty. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And remember, <laughs> and, uh, and you'll be happy at the end, thank Kitty. I promise you. <laughs> when I'm not here, Kitty, you'll, you'll be happy. <laughs> And remember, the library is out of the budget, and the library is yep. responsible for their own tax cap. Yep. Actually, I was going to ask you that. I know we have uh, well, a second. 76 is the difference. Yes, it is. Uh, $276,000 no, is the difference between the tax. $276,000 is the difference between no. last year's tax levy. Right, that's what I see. That, that's, that's the tax that's, levy. That's, right. that's the difference. 276. And 276. last year, did you Which have... Which was eaten up in um, um, <coughs> tree retirement. Did you have the... Library fund though in that last year. Or no, was we also down? we also right. yeah. we we put it out for money. And also is the like the but 396 me, is that included in the 774 No. Let me let me explain something to you just real quick. Yeah, no, no, it's not. Okay, it's below That's, it. I, I see so that. so let me just explain this so you do understand it. Last year we reduced taxes 4.4 percent. Right. So um, you know the library being included or not included. We still reduce it 4.4 percent, um, even with the library. I think in it, what um, what we had, what we did with the cap, was when it got when it um, got filed the first year in 2012, which was I wasn't here. The library was put in. The fire department wasn't. The fire top department's not exempt from the cap because it's not a fire district. It's a, you know, it's a contract that we have with the cost of doing business for the town. We went back to 2012, the controller's office worked with us, the library was taken out, the fire district was put in, so that became the, 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 um, the um, baseline for 2012. Mm -hmm. 
then we didn't file 2013 or 14 because we were below the cap and we didn't know we had to and the controls office never told us we did. So when we called up to do it, to see this year, where, you know, to understand the cap, what they told us was we had to go back so we redid 2012 to have it correct based on the fire department and the library. And then we added, did the 2013, we did the 2014, and then that's how um, we were told by all the, when you fill in all the fields, they tell you what your levy has to be this year, the standard cap, and that's when they said 7,740247. And then the library will be a separate tax over and above in of itself independently. It, this is gonna be a little. So it's about 1.2%. Well, well, that's what I got before. I think I got like 1.25 or 1.29. Yeah, no, what I see this is, this has changed. Yeah, but that's um, be, um, I think I got like 1.2. And that, 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 that assumes that the total. That assumes 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 the total assessed value remains the same. The total assessed value increases, that percentage will go down. Right. It decreases or goes slightly. And it did go, it did decrease. It decreased um, a little bit. Now, if you look at the chart that I gave you over on one of those charts, yeah, has the assessed value. Oh, um, yeah, I see that. It had yeah, the assessed so value, is. and then it has gone down slightly since this number, since... Uh, we needed to go up. We needed to go up. Of course we needed to go up. We needed to go up, but and we need to uh, encourage businesses to come in that are coming to our town and make applications to our boards that actually create jobs and create but revenue the and is by, the to assessment, be accepted into our community. It did go up. Well, it, it did go. <clears throat> we need rateables that, we need rateables homes cost you more money, you need businesses to come in and to be able to build and build. Uh, but this isn't the final number. This isn't the final number here. What I have on this chart I gave you back okay. in 10-9. Right. It's decreased a little bit because there was a certiorari that um, got um, determined and it knocked the number down. And actually there were two, two projects that uh, one in court, in small claims court, which knocked us down a little bit. Okay. So, All right. No further discussion. And uh, if there is, so anyway, so did we vote? No, we no. did not vote. Okay, so all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, motion so carried. Yeah, well, um, well, thank you. Okay. I want to thank the supervisor for preparing a very well thought out and very concise budget that both maintains all of our services but it also maintains all of our fund balances at a very healthy level. I don't believe that an auditor would come in and say that they are either too high nor too low. So I want to thank you very much for the work you put in. I'm very, very pleased by this budget. Sure. Yes. Okay, so what I would I like to- I feel the same way. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're gonna, we're gonna add to the chorus. It was uh, very enjoyable to uh, work with you on my first budget. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Very much. <laughs> okay, okay. So um, what I would like to do is um, just have a motion to go executive session for just a very quick, short discussion on personnel that is relative to the budget. There will be no new. And this is the last time there will be a decision made. made. There will be no decisions made. So I'm just, like, I'm really just filling you so in on, just filling you in on something. Second. All favor. Aye. Aye. So thank you, and board 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 Bob, I guess we're done with you. We're done, yeah. I had to go to the Bob. Thank you. Yes, we heard that. Thank you, Bob. Very much.